Well, good evening, everyone. We thought we'd better uh, come on. We're just having a couple little uh, technical setups here. Uh, all the uh, extra precautions we take uh, with the COVID-19 uh, responses and everyone is uh, well spaced out among the council chamber. We do have one councillor on a uh, uh, electronic platform uh, the city uses called Teams. And so Councillor Ron Brown is uh, in the meeting uh, coming through on, on Teams uh, when he wants to join in. Uh, apart from that, all other councillors are in the, uh, in the uh, gallery in the, uh, in the uh, council chamber here. So I think without further ado, we will uh, get underway. We've just got one councillor uh, just getting his... Uh, Laptop logged in and uh, all the tech. You're good. All right. So um, I think we're good to go. Then, Madam Clerk, whenever you're ready. Uh, roll call, Your Worship. And I've taken the roll, and all members of Council are present, including Councillor Brown uh, on Teams. Next item, please. Uh, motion to adopt this evening's agenda, Your Worship. Moved by Councillor Shaboye, seconded by Councillor Lupke. Let us see you all around the corners here. Any changes or additions? Seeing none, call for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. And I'm going to turn this on. So again, uh, Councillor Brown, if he's uh, listening, uh, I'll just have you, like we did the other meeting, mute your mic, and then when you... Um, want to be heard unmuted and um, similarly so I could see on the screen there Ron so uh, maybe even uh, you can raise your hand to uh, vote so that part will be fine and then just um, unmute your mic just mute it for now and then unmute it when you do want to speak if you care to speak okay uh, next item please motion to adopt the meeting of uh, the minutes of the meeting regular meeting held April 20th Moved by Councillor Cameron, seconded by Councillor Cullen. Any errors or omissions? Seeing none, we'll call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried, including Councillor Brown, who I can see is pretty slick. Uh, next item, please. A confirmation of the minutes of the special meeting held April 20th. Moved by Councillor Parker. Seconded by Councillor Loreggio. Any changes uh, or omissions? And seeing none, a call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried, including Councillor Brown. Next item, please. Under the order of presentations, Your Worship, we have Steve McMillan on behalf of Bellafield Holdings regarding the conditions of the development agreement for the subdivision of 1901 and 1905 34th Street. Very good. So we've got uh, Mr. McMillan waiting out in the hall to respect the space, and he'll come straight up to the podium. So thanks for your cooperation, and welcome, Steve. Thank you, Your Worship. Good evening, Council. Um, I'm here on behalf of uh, Bellafield Holdings tonight. Um, we had a, uh, a planning commission meeting uh, last week regarding our next phase of 75 lots in Bellafield. It's for our uh, phase one and phase uh, our Bellafield development um, and there's just a couple conditions that we had brought up um, as potential issues um, with the Planning Commission however it was just passed on as items that would come to council tonight uh, but upon checking um, I guess the report that you received like the minutes from the previous Planning Commission meeting we did adjust those adjust those yes. okay perfect um, but I'll still bring up the issue, I guess, again, just to uh, elaborate, I guess. So the, the two conditions that we, we did still have an issue with were, um, the minor one was the tree contribution clause. And the reason we're bringing that up is um, for this development, we were hoping that uh, we could install the, our own trees in the substance. So this was the practice, I believe, by the city roughly eight to 10 years ago and prior. All developers would put in their own trees. And then at one point, uh, it was decided the, the city would take that over. And then they would start the trees, take a contribution, the trees would be planted. I guess the issue we're running into now is that uh, 
the trees aren't getting planted for about a year and a half after the people move in. And it's just based on the timing, I believe, when the city takes inventory of what permits or does a, an inspection of what properties need the tree. And if you don't have grass in at that point, they won't. Well, your uh, mic up a little straighter there. Sorry. Then Say that. There, yeah. is that better? I hope so. Hope so. <laughs> um, and so the issue was the timing of the planting of the tree. So if it was inspected in the spring and the sod wasn't in yet, because you don't have the grass in until June, that tree wouldn't be planted until the following fall is when the trees planted by the city. So we were having some, um, I guess some comments from um, homeowners just wondering why the tree isn't getting put in at the time that the house takes occupancy. So at the time that we put in the grass, the shrubs, we would like to put the tree in at the same time. So currently in the development agreement, it says that we pay a contribution we would just like to have the option, if it can be worked out with administration, that the city specs the tree and we can install it at the time that we do all other landscaping. Uh, the second point uh, was related to the development cost charge payment schedule. So we put in a request saying that we would pay the development cost charge. Uh, we would pay half at the time of signing of the development agreement of 143000 $196.46 and proposed that we would pay the second installment of the same amount on the two year anniversary date um, of that signed agreement. And the reason we were asking for this was the subdivision we did was for 75 lots, which was quite large. Um, rather than putting in, you know, either three 25 lot subdivisions or two of 35 each. Um, we did it all in one shot and I mean as city staff can attest every time we go through one of these applications it's, it's very time consuming on our end for our staff for city staff and it's about a six month process of a lot of meetings a lot of you know, arguing a lot of negotiation and how we had done it previously is we had done a larger subdivision and then you would stage it so you develop so many lots your contributions and then you would do the next stage develop the roads of the lots in this case we would develop everything up front so we're putting all that cost up but the market uptake of those lots doesn't change whether we do them all at once or we do them in stages so we were hoping if we're putting in the additional capital to develop all the lots and all the roads that works better for fire protection works better for garbage pickup so all those things are finished um, just not putting up the large sum for the development cost charge when we can't take any income on those lots until they all sell. So rather than doing, waiting for that 60th, 70th lot to sell, um, this way it just helps with the burden of the upfront cost. So that was the reason for that request. And the final, the final request was just related to um, the oversizing. Um, so the oversizing, has become an issue because of the amendments made to the Southwest Secondary Plan in 2018. <clears throat> and the supplemental development agreement parameters that outline oversizing for infrastructure as well. Um, we've had quite a bit of, of back and forth and some issues on what information is required, who's required to provide it. Um, we're, we're very close to getting that worked out, I believe. Um, <coughs> I mean, our request is that this application receives approval tonight. And if there's a way that we can make that work, I mean, that would work for us rather than losing additional time. Um, but I mean, that condition in there, that's still condition number one is gonna cause delays for us. And if there's a way the council can um, remove that condition and we can work out oversizing for the entire development at a point in the future, I mean, that that would work on our end. There's just a lot of, of information that might not even be final, that might just be a placeholder information for now on these costs. And to have all that information now when it could just change in the future, that's a lot of money that either we're paying up front and the city's reimbursing us, it should just be done right once. Our, our request tonight, and if there's any questions, I can do my best to answer. 
Very good. Uh, open the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. McMillan. Open the floor for questions. Uh, Councillor Barry. Thank you, Worship. Uh, through you to Mr. McMillan. Uh, Steve, first question I'm going to ask is about the trees and kind of going back to past practice. Um, if you guys plant the trees yourself, would it be under the direction of the city as to what type of tree you're planting? And I'll tell you why, is I've had some concerns up around uh, Marquis Crescent with trees that were planted by the city there years ago that are causing a lot of problems. So I don't want to see that carry over to Bellafield. And that, so would this be something that you would work with uh, probably planning in the city to, to decide what type of tree would be planted and that's what you have to go with? Yes, through your worship to Councillor Barry, um, we requested that the city would just spec the tree and then we buy that tree and and plant it. So it would be planted the same, the city specifications, but they would direct us at what tree to put in. Okay. <clears throat> um, you finish? I'm oh, finished on that one. Yeah. Okay. And Councillor Cameron? Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Mr. McMillan. Thank you very much for the presentation there, Steve. Um, I'll ask one more question just along the lines with the trees. Once they are in and three years down the road, uh, you know, a dozen of them are, are dead. Is it, uh, is it the company that takes on the maintenance of them or would the city then be responsible for maintaining them? Um, and then I'll, I'll take the second question after. Okay. Through Your Worship to Councillor Cameron. Um, I believe the, um, the company that um, provides the tree provides a warranty period probably for a year, but after that the city would take ownership and if there's any issues after that it would be no different than the city installing it. Um, the one year warranty period for installation and I could be wrong on that number but it's, I believe it's one year. Um, and then after that, yeah, if there's any issues the city takes over ownership of the trees. Okay. Second, if I could, Your Worship. Um, just wondering, you had mentioned with regards to the, the sale of the lots and, and having that two-year window where you wanted to sort of backload the, the second half of the development charge. That would not be contingent on the lots actually selling, correct? So if two years down the road you didn't meet um, your own sort of internal caps, you would still be liable for the development charge, correct? Uh, that's true through your worship to Councillor Cameron. The, the timing was just based on um, the previous 50 lots that we did in Bellafield. So we have four lots remaining and there was 50 lots that were started in I believe 2016. So we're in year four. Um, so we just kind of put a guesstimate together on the 75, 75 lots that would be a four to five year build out. So rather than saying we'd pay one now and then one at the end, we just said two years just gives that additional buffer of shelling out <clears throat> all the money for the infrastructure, all the lots, um, but it would just, yeah, help with cost of the development because we won't see any of that because market uptake isn't there for that many. Thank you. And Councillor Parker? Uh, thank you, Worship. So you do, uh, Mr. McMillan. I'm just wondering if you can elaborate a little bit on the oversizing, um, what type of, uh, what the process is, what, what we're dealing with, and, and if in your opinion, um, we're going to be able to uh, get some type of approval tonight. Are we all going to be in agreement and be able to comply with all the various agencies' reg uh, regulations for this? For three or your worship to Councillor Parker. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to get fully, I guess, into it, but some of the issues are regarding um, uh, pipe sizing. So, uh, there was a previous employee of the city who's no longer there who was the manager on the project and there was a minimum pipe size put in for uh, oversizing, um, for us to be able to claim oversizing. So if something within our development was a certain pipe size, it had to meet this, say for land drainage, it had to meet be a 600 millimeter pipe. And if, it, if our pipe was 425, we didn't receive any compensation up to 600 it was only for something that was bigger so there could be instances where we could design pipe within our development that works for us but as soon as you oversize to compensate benefiting areas if it didn't get over that 600 we're paying that oversizing cost and getting no reimbursement to benefit another development so that's kind of the issue and again we're the first I believe to go through this with the city on the secondary plan amendment and these oversizing charges in this area. So it might have been a good idea at the time and we did object to some of these issues at that time but 
it's the first time you really dive into it and you're kind of figuring out some of these issues and maybe that's something that can be figured out in the future I mean the secondary plan is going to be amended probably later this year when we incorporate the annex lands because we're putting together a secondary plan amendment and neighborhood plan for that area so some of these issues could be looked at at that point um, but again I'm not an engineer so I don't want to get too deep into oversizing because that I'll get out of my comfort zone pretty quick. <laughs> and um, Troy, you're finished here, Councilor? Yeah, thank you. Yeah. And Councilor Fawcett, then? Thank you, through your worship, to Mr. McMillan. On this particular uh, phase here, I, you know, we're, we're talking again and again about doing that uh, southern extension of uh, water, sewer, everything down there. Is this connecting to this portion, or are we still extending off of the uh, end of the other line your worship to councillor Fawcett yes we are um, within the, uh, the still that northern catchment so right now we're not going to run into an issue of, of not having capacity um, but I think this is probably this and possibly a little bit more could possibly still go north but that lift station is going to be required probably in one of our next years so hopefully the timing is going to work out okay with that not in this instance. Okay. Um, didn't have other hands um, for myself. So, Steve, just to clarify, and I'm sure later Ryan will be up um, talking about some of the details, but on the oversizing issue, just to understand that the way the uh, report, uh, sort of the recommendation is supplied to council, then it's like 1A where the, the literally puts in X cost, X uh, uh, cost in several places, and then um, the estimated reimbursement values will be finalized, total recovery costs, which is important to you. That's the money you get back upon the city accepting the actual unit price uh, design, so on and so forth. So I got the sense from that that <clears throat> were we to accept that, then it wouldn't be holding anything up. It would mean that we would be it's a bit unusual, but on the other hand, it was looked to me like it's designed to um, keep the project going and sort of maintaining good faith. Uh, um, I understand this isn't your first company's first project in this city and likely not the last one. Um, so um, that eventually this discussion gets worked out and the unit costs kind of get the blanks get filled in uh, for the reimbursement program. So is that the way you see it, or am I mistaken? Again, I would be asking Ryan the same question, but since you're up here now, I'll get your take on that. Yeah, no, Your Worship, you're correct. Um, I mean, it's not often we're arguing against getting paid back money. So in this instance, that's kind of what's happening. We're saying that there's a lot of information that needs to be put into this, and it's up front in front of our development that we have to I guess finalize all this engineering work for our entire development, all benefiting areas within this um, land drainage catchment area. And uh, outside of our, our development and probably one that's developed to the north of us, everything else is kind of hypothetical at this point. So you're putting all this work into numbers, which are great to have, but at the same time, probably be better if we kind of got into this a little bit more and you can work out those numbers to be sure you know what you're working with but I don't see why it has to be done at this instance there's a couple pipe sizes that have to be finalized to drain some land from the north based on that pond being removed north of Maryland that's pretty straightforward the pond sizing of um, what's required just for us and what's required to benefit everybody else when you don't know exactly what everybody else is going to do. There's a lot of land on 34th Street that could be developed as higher density. There's, there's a lot of question marks, so but you're saying that in good faith we don't plan to do this development and leave town, so there's going to be multiple phases and stages to come next where this information could get figured out. Yeah, uh, but I guess I, I heard you to say earlier on um, with respect to the oversizing, it was just that um, you're concerned that the passage of this, though, um, 
had parameters that would hold up the development. Uh, uh, you know, that's often um, that's conditional. Uh, you know, you, you can't proceed until we've figured out uh, another portion out. Whereas I'm not sure if um, I'm reading it that way. Again, I'll get clarified by our administration. But I was just, um, do you see that as the case? Like, in other words, if if it's left the way it is, I mean, the the matter gets passed and you get to keep working and eventually that clause will get worked out. Yeah. Yes, through your worship. If that was the case, you're not, you don't, don't really have an objection to that as long as you can keep moving. Right. If we weren't going to move forward because of that, because it all had to be finalized now, then we do have an issue with it. But if that can... If we can be under the assumption that we're going to work with the administration to figure out those numbers, then we don't. Yeah, as I say, the way I'm reading it says, the estimated reimbursement values will be finalized upon the city accepting the actual unit prices. In other words, like this document okay. that council is going to pass is, um, you know, leaving that piece to administration and the developer to finalize mm -hmm. uh, in due course. But does it? If it's worded in such a way that, we can work that out, but I thought that that clause had something to do with it, that that it, it's going to cause delays. Well, we'll uh, yeah. it does. Okay, well, and we'll get uh, Ryan's explanation when he uh, comes up to speak. Because the oversight to figure out the oversizing for the entire development before we can move forward with this phase, when it doesn't really affect a lot of things happen. We're not building the pond, the full pond with this phase. It'll just be another stage, another stage. But these requirements are asking us to develop everything and have all the numbers worked out for future developments that not might happen for 20 years. Okay. That's, the, that's the problem. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Reggio. Thank you, Your Worship. Al along those lines, uh, this, this might be a simplistic uh, question to ask, but with, with the oversize, could this clause maybe be set aside as a caveat that within, if we approve this tonight, the rest of the, the document that within six months we'll have an oversize agreement or else we could penalize the company or, uh, you know, set a time frame to have this done, maybe not tonight, but within the next six months or by the end of the construction season, uh, the city and the developer will have an agreement in place as to what the oversize costs will be. That way everybody will be happy. I'll just throw that out there. I don't know if it's something that can be done at this stage. I don't know anything about, I know very little about the legalities of these, but I'll just throw it out there. Yeah, well, we'll hear from uh, um, Ryan and uh, Patrick shortly on the process then. I just wanted to get kind of Steve's take on it while he was at the Yeah, yeah I, I, could, I could answer uh, that if I, yeah, through your worship to Councillor Reggio. I mean, to me, it, our request would be that it would get worked out when these amendments to the secondary or secondary plan are happening this summer with our other development and it incorporates the, our drainage area for Bellafield, all the areas that we're already talking about, and then the annex land that all forms the same drainage boundary. So I mean to have all that worked out when you're taking into consideration all the drainage infrastructure within that catchment, that would make <coughs> sense to me. And that that process would happen within your time frame. Thank you. Other questions of Mr. McMillan? I guess that's it. Thank you very much. A motion to receive the presentation will be in order. Councillor Barry. Thank you, Worship. I move the presentation by Steve McMillan on behalf of Bellafield Holdings Limited with respect to the conditions of the development agreement for the subdivision for 1901 and 1905 34th Street be received. Seconded by Councillor Reggio. Any discussion on receiving? Seeing none, call for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried, including Councillor Brown. Next item, please. The community comments feedback, Your Worship, and as we have no members of the public due to physical distancing. I suspect that that is a mute point tonight. So we can move on to committee reports. Thank you. And right off the bat, we got a report from the Keystone Center, Councillor Lupke. 
Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, starting with the postponement of the Chamber Gala Dinner on March the 12th, all the remaining events had been cancelled or postponed at the Keystone Centre up until this point. I believe there were maybe a couple of minor events that took place at the Ag Centre in that first couple of weeks that were very minor attended. Um, approximately at this point, and this was as of our April board meeting, which was uh, the last week of April, approximately 1.7 million in projected revenue had been lost before last week's announcement that the National Arabian and Half Arabian Horse Show in August would be cancelled. With that cancelled, uh, based on the numbers that we had received, that would push the estimated revenue lost at the Keystone Centre to about $2.1 million. Beginning in mid-March, the Keystone Centre management immediately went into expense management and a review of operating expenses resulted in a savings of about $675,000. Staff at the Keystone Centre spent considerable time on in-house maintenance and beautification projects over the last week, eight weeks. If there is a small silver lining, the building should look as good as it's ever looked once it's able to reopen. Keystone Centre offered to provide space to both the province of Manitoba and City of Brandon for any COVID-19 related needs and there were some initiatives discussed but the space has not been needed at this time. Major challenges for the Keystone Centre in the coming months, uh, obviously managing cash flow for the organization. It's expected the operating line of credit will need to be accessed in the month of June, beginning in the month of June. Uh, putting a budget together for 2020-2021, as uh, most of you know, the Keystone's fiscal year runs from August 1 to July 31st, so it's understandably difficult to forecast what things are going to be looking like in the uh, first part of the coming fiscal year. And um, we've had this discussion at our board meetings in the Keystone Centre will quite likely be one of the last buildings able to open and host events when restrictions are lifted. Uh, management is working on some new concepts and ideas to generate some revenue for the facility, but the hosting of large gatherings or events is several months away, we suspect. Very good. Not a uh, fun report to have to give, but thanks very much for uh, keeping us up to date and for also, um, especially the team over there, managing through this very unprecedented time. Uh, each time we have to announce another event that is cancelled, winter fair, summer fair, Arabian horse show, lots of smaller things that uh, a lot of those fall at the feet of the Keystone for sure. So any questions of Councillor Lupke on the Keystone report? Councillor Barry. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, to Councillor Lupke, um, Bruce is a prior member of the Keystone board for many years and that I know sometimes the fragile position that place is in and so this certainly does not help them one iota. Um, <coughs> What I'm wondering is if the board's discussed or is management uh, trying to get a plan in place for how they're going to approach the lost revenue because I, I, I personally I just can't see them losing this much money and surviving. So they're, they're obviously going to have to do something whether it's coming to the city or going to the province or, or extending their line of credit or increasing it like is there some things in place or plans coming up that we can expect to maybe be hearing from the Keystone? I think those, uh, I mean, Quite honestly, through your worship to Councillor Barry, quite honestly, I think a lot of those discussions are taking place behind the scenes, particularly with the province. I know uh, there was uh, about a three or four page report prepared by the Keystone Centre Management that was sent to the Minister of Municipal Affairs to know exactly what was kind of going on in regards to this pandemic and uh, with his worship. So I, those discussions are kind of happening behind the scenes, but I think the big thing is it's almost like me it's a little bit of about a wait and see approach kind of understanding a little bit more about when some revenue could possibly start coming in and then you can start either making some plans at that point or in a worst case scenario um, I know we've talked about accessing the line of credit and being able to kind of get through into the fall with that uh, ability and then kind of addressing it perhaps in the summer or fall area. Thanks very much for that information. Any other questions, uh, Councillor Shaboy? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Through to Councillor Lukey. Uh, one um, thing that your board might want to look at is some organizations uh, can function if they physically distance correctly. For example, the university is looking at large classes that can be, but they need the space for it. So there is opportunities that um, they're starting to look at in other cities for providing university classes in large spaces. And one thing the Keystone Centre does have is large space. So it's just maybe an opportunity to start uh, marketing yourself and looking at some of those uh, 
opportunities? Your Worship, to Councillor Shoya, that has actually been part of the discussion where even some events that might nor normally fit at the Keystone Centre based on their rather small size could actually be a fit there earlier than some other venues based on those uh, ability to have that has been part of the discussion as far as some concepts and ideas of, of things that could possibly generate some small revenue. Good suggestion. Um, any other <coughs> questions? Councillor Cullen. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Councillor Lukey. Obviously, whether you're the Keystone Centre or you're a small arena in southwestern Manitoba somewhere, we've got the same problem. Um, so I'm encouraged that you're telling me that we're in conversation with the province because again this is going to be uh, whether it's a Centennial Auditorium, the Keystone Center and we can say any other rural rink or, or uh, community center is going to be having a tough time. So uh, you're saying that there are conversations that are happening now with the province? Um, through your worship to Councillor Cullen I would be safe to say that the province is very aware of the Keystone Center's predicament at this point. How active those conversations are at this point, I'm not 100% sure. Just a question, the uh, federal government's not normally involved in the, the Keystone, but certainly they've had a uh, significant number of uh, emergency uh, relief funds and it's been hard to keep track of who qualifies and, and do not qualify. Keystone's in a little bit of a unique position. On one hand, it's kind of like a business. On the other hand, it's a non-profit organization. On the other hand, it's related to two levels of government. So uh, presume that um, there's been some examination of those federal programs, and if there were any that uh, fit, uh, you'd be trying to avail yourselves of them. So I'm not sure if... Uh, have any comment on that, either, either board member? Go ahead. Uh, thanks, Your Worship. Sure, I can. I was just actually going to bring that up. Um, our management team has been examining every <laughs> funding uh, opportunity available through uh, the various levels of government and would hesitate to uh, say they'll probably knock on our door at some point uh, in the future as well. Um, but it should be said that they have actually done a very, very good job of carrying expenses as best as possibly can um, for a facility that size. So while well, the revenues are um, clearly off by enormous amounts of money with the reduction in expenses, the management's done a really good job. And I think the situation could be a lot worse, but they've done a really good job of managing that, much as the city ourselves have. So um, anyway, they are looking at those opportunities on every time one's announced them. They're, they're, uh, Scouring it pretty closely to see how it could fit for the Keystone. So, like you say, the the federal government may be an option. That helps. Okay, thank you. Any other questions of uh, either of the board members? Not seeing any. So, thank you very much. Uh, before we take a motion to receive that, we will check. Sometimes there's other uh, committee reports, albeit. Uh, some organizations, committees are meeting a little less often than in the past, but uh, some are meeting virtually. So if any other councillors had reports to make, uh, we take them now. Okay, seeing none, uh, a, a motion to receive the Keystone Report would be in order, please. Councillor Parker, seconded by Councillor Barry. Any discussion? Seeing none, we'll call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried, including Councillor Brown. Next item, please. The order of inquiries, Your Worship. Oh. Pardon me? I have no inquiry. I'm jumping ahead. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Reggio. Thank you, Your Worship. This goes back to an issue we had in the fall. I received a couple of phone calls. Uh, some wild turkeys have moved into the Argyle Park area, Memorial Crescent area, and uh, quite... Bluntly, they become a nuisance. They're digging up yards, uh, causing a bit of damage, uh, leaving poop in driveways and other things. And to clarify, Your Worship, we're talking about the birds. Okay. 
<laughs> uh, some of the questions I've been getting, uh, like who is responsible for controlling this population, and if there's a turkey on your property causing damage, what, if anything, can the resident do? Very good. Well, uh, Acting City Manager Dean Hammond has looked into this. Does have a response for us? Go ahead. Thank you, Your Worship. This response has been provided by Chief Wayne Balkan, Chief of Police for Brandon Police Service. In order to develop a reply to Councillor Lareggio's inquiry, the following actions were undertaken by Brandon Police Service on uh, May uh, 5th to 8th of this year. Uh, the police chief contacted uh, Allison Kraus Danielson, regional wildlife biologist with Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development. As wild turkeys are a game bird under the Manitoba Wildlife Act and regulations, they therefore therefore fall under the authority of Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development. I was advised that Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development undertakes trapping and relocation of wild turkeys only in the winter months. They will consider future trapping and relocation depending on the nature and number of concerns that they receive from the public in conjunction with the size of the flock. Trapping was conducted in the winter months of 2019 and 2020, and 22 birds were trapped and relocated outside of the city of Brandon. Trapping and relocation of wild turkeys is continually monitored and evaluated by Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development. That organization requests that calls received at BPS be redirected to their office at 204-726-6441, that number again, 204-726-6441, so that they may get first-hand accounts of the nature of the problem, develop statistical information, and offer advice as required. The Brandon Police Service clerical front desk attendants direct individuals who call BPS to make their concerns known to Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development at the above number, Brandon Police Service also shares any complaints that they receive regarding the wild turkeys with Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development. BPS Animal Control Officers will continue to work with the province in managing the wild turkeys but will not be undertaking any offensive action against the wild turkeys. Individual property owners are encouraged to contact Manitoba Agriculture and Resource Development at once again 204-726-6441 for further advice or assistance. I have attached to this reply the public service announcement that was part of the Brandon Police Service's education campaign on wild turkeys in 2016. I have also printed out the information that is found on the embedded link so that it is readily available. Most questions the general public may have regarding wild turkeys in the City of Brandon can be answered with these facts. Okay, that's a very uh, thorough explanation. Uh, sounds like the province are routinely uh, relocating the wild turkeys, but uh, so still we would advise a number. So we would advise residents not to take uh, action upon themselves, to either just shoo the birds away and leave it at that? Yeah. Well, and again, I think there was advice on that, as the chief mentioned, that, you know, they, they do uh, caution people. The birds, I think, can be aggressive so not to be probably doing that I think it's best to call Manitoba Agriculture at that number and let them uh, try and intervene so thank you good inquiry it was a good uh, explanation and up next I think Councillor Dejarly go ahead thank you through your worship um, the audible lights uh, which were welcomed and thank you and necessary are audible through the night in the downtown um, is there something we can do to assist folks uh, trying to get a good night's rest? Okay, and uh, Mr. Hammond has uh, received a reply for us, so go ahead, uh, Dean. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. This response has been provided by Sam Van Housen, Traffic and Transportation Planner with Strategic Infrastructure. The City of Brandon has begun to procure audible devices to make traffic signals more accessible and started with the installation at the intersection of 10th and Rosser in the summer months of last year. This single intersection was installed with eight beacons, two at each corner to allow for maximum coverage. 
Throughout this pilot project, engineering received no complaints of noise or disruption during the day or at night. It was decided to reduce the number of beacons at each intersection from 8 to 4, from 8 to 4, to allow for more intersections to be retrofit, retrofitted and potentially to reduce the echoing. Beacons were installed earlier this spring at many of the intersections in the downtown with the same calibration settings as the ones put up at 10th and Rosser. The engineering department suspects that the rise in complaints of noise during quiet hours may be due to the lowered background traffic noise at night. The beacon volume levels can be adjusted during quiet hours to mitigate the noise and echo in the absence of background traffic. To complete this, the city's crews will have to take down the beacons at each of the intersections to recalibrate and reinstall as our resources and time allows. If there are any particular intersections where complaints have been given to the councillor, they can be forwarded to the engineering department for prioritization. Thank you, Through Your Worship. So if you could just, uh, I'm going to play uh, the sound that it's making so that we can understand what they're talking about. So that's happening through the night. Uh, if you have your window open in the downtown, um, you can hear it six, seven blocks away. Um, so I would recommend that they take a look at all of the intersections <laughs> um, and do their best to calibrate them to reduce the noise in the evening uh, because they are a welcome addition uh, to, the, to the downtown for sure, but they are definitely keeping people up at night and I suspect that it's because we have not just the less traffic, which is certainly part of it, but we've also added additional intersections in the spring and now we're hearing the complaints. So it could be that we have more intersections going, uh, but they're, they've got them on a timer. Uh, so the folks that are speaking with, it's like every 27 seconds, I can, I'm hearing that ding, 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 I can't get to sleep. So um, hopefully our resources and time allow us to address this as quickly as possible. And again, I think it would be helpful, as, as Sam has asked, if there are, you know, given the fact it'll take some time, so if there, if your constituents um, might advise the ones that are more problematic than, than others, and they would at least do the ones that are the closest to the sleeping uh, inhabitants uh, more so than, like I'm, I'm thinking that 10th and Rosser may not be near the open windows as much as maybe some of the newer ones. So if if, yeah. if you can get any intelligence for them, that will help them to, you know, correct the worst ones first. Is all sure. through, through, through your worship, I'm, I'm suspecting it's probably uh, Ninth and Princess, uh, Tenth and Princess, maybe Tenth and Lorne, as they've gotten closer to um, uh, uh, area residents. Uh, but I'm wondering if maybe I could actually connect these residents with engineering and they rather than me being a middle person and they could um, talk to them directly yeah that'd Thanks. be good okay um, that was all the inquiries we were aware of now and again one comes up through the day if there are any we could take them now seeing none we can move on to the next item please the order of announcements your worship announcements Councillor Lukey. Thank you, Worship. Um, on behalf of Councillor Chaboye and Councillor Loreggio, the other two council members on our Grants Review Committee, I just wanted to advise community groups that grant applications are being accepted for nonprofit organizations in Brandon that wish to be considered for grant funding in the 2021 physical year. Uh, there's a web address in order to uh, access the web form to apply. Uh, my best recommendation is to uh, look for that on the city website or contact our city clerk's department to uh, have them uh, send you to the correct website and uh, deadline for applying is the end of June. Thanks for uh, reminding folks of that. And I think Councillor Barry. Yep. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I just want to, uh, for residents that are watching tonight, and specifically more for those in Linden Lane's ward, uh, I just wanted to let them know that I had a conversation with the General Manager of Development Services late last week, and a decision has been made to postpone Phase 2 of the Willowdale Road project for this year. So basically everything that was supposed to be done from 
uh, where it was left off last year around uh, the corner of Linden Boulevard and Willowdale over to Ashgrove is not going to get done this year now. We're going to push it out to next year and, and for various reasons and that, but uh, it'll give an opportunity for us to, to finish up what we had started last year because there's still some work there to be done and then pretty much give residents a break from the interruption in traffic that we've had there uh, over the past year and that. So uh, it will get done. Um, it was an imperative that we did it this this year and that. And I think this was a very logical decision on on administration's part to, to postpone this for a year. Um, I, d I did agree with them on this. I thought maybe it was time just to have a break, wait till next year, and let's get at it again, but to finish up what we did last year uh, with, with some of the issues we had with weather and that. So I just want to let, let residents know because we had said that we were going to host a meeting for the community to talk about this uh, phase two development so that uh, people had a little better understanding of how things were going to be I guess interrupted along that road this year, but we won't be doing it now. So basically, aside from the uh, finish up work we have to do from last year, there shouldn't be a whole lot of interruption along with Lydia this summer. Good, Councillor Barry, thanks for uh, putting that out there. That's good information for the neighborhood. Uh, Councillor Shaboy. Uh, thank you, Worship. Uh, I'd like to announce um, uh, an exhibition that is showing online for the Art Gallery of Southwestern Manitoba. Um, I got, received a call from Deidre um, Chisholm, the director of the art gallery, and she would like everyone to visit uh, the latest exhibit. It's from Casey Adams. She's um, a Cree Ojibwe artist from Winnipeg, and she's working with Birch Park in a pretty uh, unique way, and, and she's hoping that um, the Brandon community will visit uh, the art gallery website, and then you can get linked into uh, Casey's work. and. Uh, and it's also showing that the art gallery has a commitment to celebrate uh, female women, uh, female artists in the prairies. Uh, so I would ask everyone to take some time and, and visit the site and any other online exhibits that they're having uh, until the doors can be opened. Thank you. Other uh, announcements? I'm kind of hesitant uh, to say this because we're not really positive they're coming this way. The uh, Canadian snowbirds are doing a kind of fly past Canada just and uh, raise spirits with respect to uh, COVID-19. And uh, um, they're to be in Manitoba tomorrow. I think they are definitely scheduled to be doing some flyovers in, in Winnipeg in the morning. And so there's some possibilities that it, they could be flying our way later in the day tomorrow. We're not positive of that so just sort of stay tuned follow Twitter they seem to be putting it out on Twitter I think they probably have a Facebook page as well kind of keep your ear to the ground if you're a big snowbird fan it certainly won't be like an air show where you go up to the airport and watch for obvious reasons I think they end up trying to fly near um, health care centers and and the like uh, to show respect to frontline workers and those sorts of things so there may be a snowbird sighting tomorrow. Uh, I can't be certain, but uh, uh, keep gazing up at the sky for a good part of the day, and we'll see what happens. So, and if there are no other announcements, we can move on to the next item. Under the order of general business, Your Worship, the temporary suspension of tax sale process for 2018 arrears. Councillor Fawcett. Yes, thank you. Through Your Worship. Uh, whereas Manitoba has declared a state of emergency as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and whereas the pandemic is causing financial difficulties for many businesses and individuals, therefore it is resolved that proceeding to offer properties for sale at, at tax sale auction be temporarily suspended for a period of four months. Executor, please. Councillor Parker, whoever wish to speak. Uh, yeah, through your worship. Uh, this is just along the lines with a lot of the things we're doing. There, there's no significant, uh, if hardly any, uh, impact on the city of Brandon. Uh, there's no financial impact on this. Um, if administration wants to speak further on it, it is, it is just along the lines of a lot of the other things we're doing. We're just putting a delay. Uh, hopefully things are good four months from now that we can address that. Very good. Again, obviously, Mr. Hammond, uh, who is also still general manager corporate services and city treasurer uh, could uh, likely answer questions if uh, there are any uh, with respect to this fairly straightforward otherwise but uh, welcome questions if there are some seeing none I think we're probably ready for the question then all those in favor 
Opposed? That is carried, including Councilor Brown. Next item, please. Is an amendment to the 2020 fee schedule regarding credit card payment convenience fees. Councilor Cameron. Your Worship, uh, Councilor Fawcett and I were trading back and forth who was taking this one. So uh, moved that the credit card convenience fee of 2.25% of the payment value be levied for payments processed using a credit card in conjunction with the City of Brandon Virtual City Hall application. And further that this fee will only apply to payments made for property taxes, water utility accounts, and accounts receivable. And further that page 31 of Schedule A, bylaw number 7260, be replaced with the attached amendment page noting this credit card convenience fee, and whereby this fee is being introduced to cover the cost incurred by the City of Brandon for accepting and processing credit card payments through the virtual City Hall application being inter introduced as a payment option as a result of the COVID-19 crisis and the Civic Administration building being closed to the general public. Thank you, please. Mr. Barry, who you wish to speak? Just very briefly, Your Worship, uh, I, I'm pleased to see this come forward. I know this was uh, an inquiry that had come forward from a couple of residents in my ward with regards to accepting credit card fees, and uh, I am happy as well to see the city address it in in a in a fee levy on it. I guess you could say because we aren't uh, generally budgeting budgeting year after year for for credit card fees in in our budget deliberations, but. I would welcome Mr. Hammond to fill in any of the gaps I may have missed. Again, um, Mr. Hammond is welcome to provide any additional information or answer questions, whatever you prefer. Councilor Reggio, thank you. Uh, thank you. Just a quick question. The two and a quarter percent, uh, will that cover the credit card fees that we will be charged for using those cards? Yeah. That's the intent. So that's kind of the idea of it. Uh, you know, I think people aren't accustomed to having to pay extra when they use their credit card at most merchants and what have you. But I mean, keeping this fair across the board that uh, and keeping our taxes in line. Um, and again, uh, property taxes are typically, uh, uh, you know, a fairly large transaction. And uh, so this is merely a uh, cost recovery. That's about the, the uh, value that the city pays uh, as a merchant uh, when people use their uh, credit card. So some people want the convenience of using their credit card. Some want points for using their credit card, but then the city pays the two and a quarter percent. So it's just really a cost recovery if uh, those that want to use their uh, credit card uh, would uh, be charged. And Councillor Cullen. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to Mr. Hammond. Um, if my memory serves me correct in the five fine print of most uh, Visa MasterCard agreements, uh, merchant agreements, um, this is, uh, this type of fee is not something that they will accept. Like as in, if you want to use their cards, you have to abide by their rules and their rules says you cannot upcharge or charge any type of fee, for example, if you were to buy a tank of gas or any other things. So I would, I would maybe um, recommend that you sort of dig into that just a little bit more, um, that I've heard of other people that tried to do that and uh, the their privilege to use MasterCard has been revoked. So might be something that you have to look into. Okay, we'll uh, leave that uh, in your hands. Yep. Just to kind of double check on that. And Councillor Fawcett. Yes, thank you, through your worship. And just sort of a, as a reminder that uh, this is this is a good option. It gives an option to people. But uh, you know, if there is any issues with things uh, like uh, taxation in particular, we have tried to implement our other plans of monthly payments and stuff like that. So if uh, there is some issues, uh, hopefully people are able to get in touch with the Treasury Department, make those arrangements, make the accommodations through their monthly payments. And, uh, if you read enough uh, credit card debt, it's not a great thing. So if you don't have to use it, maybe look at other options we offer. Councilor Barry. Thank you, Worship. Uh, through you to administration, just curious about uh, the definition where it says payments made for property taxes, water utility accounts, and accounts receivable. What defines an account receivable? Is it a parking ticket? Is it a permit we're trying to take out for building? Or like what can we pay with with our credit card? 
Is that the chairman? Uh, through your worship, so that would be uh, for general receivables, uh, ambulance bill. Again, it would be up to the, the customer to decide if they want to incur the uh, the uh, convenience fee for the privilege of using their, their credit card as opposed to paying by other methods. So just to follow up your worship through you then, so if I was taking out a building permit for whatever, I can pay that bill with my credit card now? Uh, I'd have to double check on whether that office is uh, providing that service or not. I'm not sure if Mr. Pulak would know. We'll look into that. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, I think maybe uh, you think the valve's on line? Ask her to call. If uh, Mrs. Rochelle is on team, she could. Uh, well, I think she's on her way up, actually. I tried to. Uh, up? Oh, she's yeah, in the she's building. Yeah, she's in the okay. building. Okay, I yes. tried to call her. <laughs> <laughs> it's just suddenly disappeared from the screen so we'll just uh, so wait half a minute here and we'll uh, get this uh, answered instead of uh, leaving it up in the air we seem to have a different echo in here it feels like being a announcer at a ball game right now <laughs> reverberating off yeah. the backdrop or something yeah. Yeah. So we're waiting for Miss Rochelle to come up just back to the conversation about the wild turkeys. I actually had some in my yard last week and did phone bylaw who directed me to Manitoba Conservation, had a very nice chat with the young lady there on the phone and gave me lots of hints and instructions on how to deal with them and, and that and she actually said that a lot of them are the ones that we're seeing are the hens of females. And basically if you make a lot of noise or I happen to have a hockey stick banging it on the cement and tree and that, it, it would run away pretty quick. So it's just the males you have to kind of watch out for whether they'll come at you or not but uh, generally they, she said they're pretty skittish and they're looking just for bird feed or bird seed or something like that if people happen to have that laying around the yard and that but really really helpful conversation for 10 minutes with her on the phone because mm -hmm. uh, I had a couple of dogs just chomping at the bit to get out the door of that turkey and that and whatever we could to hold them back but that was a, a good education on that one so you are officially our turkey expert mm -hmm. on council? As long as I can pull my old Victoria bill out of the basement, we're good, yeah. <laughs> well, she may not be on the way up. I think we'll... Uh... Well, she, she might be available now. I think, again, that we can... Uh, um, you know, these are sort of fine details. I think that we can probably... Get the answers back. I don't know if it'll prevent us from passing the motion. So no, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. Just curious as to what how yeah. broad this is. Yeah. So. We'll get that like an inquiry. We'll just get uh, a few more details sent out to council so that we uh, fully understand that. Any other uh, questions before we call the question? Seeing none, call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Thank you. And next item, please. Also under general business, you worship the social socioeconomic justification to modify class four wetland. That's Barry. Thank you, worship. Unless Councilor Brown would like to do this, it actually falls more into his ward or will at some point and doesn't mind, but I could make this on his behalf if you wish. And yeah, well, maybe let him second it if he sure. Okay. Easier for you to read it. Um, um, that the letter providing socioeconomic justification for the modification of a class four wetland be submitted to the Manitoba Drainage and Water Control Licensing Branch in support of a request from VBJ Developments Limited for a damage or drainage license on the lands known as the South Brandon Village Development. If Councilor Brown wants to second that, he could raise his hand. He has. Seconded by Councilor Brown. Whoever wishes to speak. I would really like somebody for administration to come up and talk about this one, Your Worship. You bet. And he's ready to do so. Mr. Nickel. Uh, through your worship uh, to council, this is a little bit of a unique one. Uh, so we've been having conversations with uh, VBJ Developments now for years about these lands, and they were annexed into the city a few years ago now. And uh, as council is well aware, there's a class 4 wetland on the property that encompasses 
a pretty significant portion of the site. Uh, so the, the next step we're at here is that we're working on some of the more detailed planning with VBJ developments and part of that is they need to submit uh, a water rights license for the ultimately looking at the wetland as well as the, the drainage for the area. So under the current provincial legislation, in short, you can't do anything with a class four wetland. I'm sure there's more words that explain it better, but that's the short of it. Uh, there is a potential exception if uh, if an applicant can provide some level of socioeconomic justification that would support that, they could explore some alternatives. So in this case, VBJ Developments has been working with uh, Native Plant Solutions. Uh, Native Plant Solutions uh, on the pond design are the national leaders in wetland conservation. Uh, and not just that, but also helping different developers create uh, naturalized wetlands out of new pond construction. So they had prepared uh, this report and we've had a, a meeting with um, the water conservation folks to talk about it. And in short, um, the discussion was, was to make a proposal for them to consider and they would go from there. Um, so part of that, it was thought that there would be strength of the proposal by having the City of Brand support the submission. Uh, so let's, just to be clear, the support to the socioeconomic justification is based on the same rationale with the annexation, which was based on the reg regional retail land supply, and it's challenging to develop that property without modifying the wetland, providing access and developable areas on some parts of it. It doesn't mean that we're proposing that the wetland be filled in, not at all. Certainly the wet area of it still will be maintained. But when you're looking at wetland classifications, the way it works is there's different zones around a wetland and it includes these other areas as part of it. We're also not proposing that it just be filled in without any thought or process to it and that's not what the developers are proposing either. That's why the Native Plant Solutions Group was hired to look at equivalencies, including naturalizing other ponds in the catchment area as part of the process and investing significant time and energy to do the correct plantings around the pond with the intent of improving stormwater management and performance of the wetland. So the intent of this process will be hopefully through the development and the planting of more of the species, thinning out the invasive species would be to improve performance. So once again, this letter that I had put together for the consideration of council to forward on is to provide that socioeconomic justification which is based on the commercial land demand and uh, hoping that the province will be able to work with the developer and the city moving forward on some different solutions to developing the site. Thank you. Very good. We'll open it up for questions of uh, Mr. Nicol. There are some, um, my, my kind of read of it. Naturally, this uh, is still a, a piece of the drainage infrastructure of the area, if you would want to call it that. And yet, on the other hand, unlike if this was a, um, a pond sort of out in the middle of rural Manitoba, I mean, normally then it you know, wouldn't really be touched. But when you've got drainage features, you know, within an urban area, you know, they, they probably need a different treatment. We did have a tour several years ago. I'm not sure if anybody uh, in the room here was, was on that. I, I was on, uh, you know, where they've done quite a bit of this in, within the city of Winnipeg, this native plant solutions uh, company, and that's where they've got the tall grasses and so on and so forth that are, you know, act as natural uh, filters and the like uh, with the proper uh, plant species. So it's um, quite uh, innovative and forward looking and so that's the kind of uh, essence of this and given the fact that the the land adjacent to it uh, you know when a in a urban setting like ours is required for uh, uh, higher and better uses so to speak uh, in terms of uh, as Ryan called it the uh, uh, commercial land supply uh, in that vicinity so that's kind of the area that council would be on side to uh, uh, you know, sort of encourage the ongoing um, negotiation, you know, kind of collaboration between all parties to, to work out a, a solution 
uh, using the you know the, the most uh, contemporary science to be able to do so. So that's kind of my take on it. Uh, I thought I saw a hand up. Yeah. Councillor Shaboy. Uh, thank you, Worship. Through to Mr. Nickel. Um, is the would the plan come back to council for review then if there is modifications made to the wetland? That's your worship to Councillor Shaboy. Under the current process, the the province is the approval authority. Uh, so through this process, the answer would be no. I mean, certainly council can make whatever request you'd like if you'd like to see a plan. But generally, in discussions of intermunicipal drainage and wetlands, since that's the provincial authority, they're the ones who are making the decision, and that's where the submission is going. So just to be clear, then, we're just endorsing a letter to start the process, the conversation, or? Yeah, through, through uh, your worship to Councillor Shaboy. Yeah, so the letter that was attached that I had written is part of the original original submission for this license to the to the province where they're the approval authority for reviewing and approving it. And part of that is to provide some socioeconomic justifications to start the dialogue, which is what his worship's talking about, is to have an approach in an urban area that's more collaborative to developing this area than it would be, for example, in a rural area, which would be just, you know, don't touch it. It's very common for other provincial approaches to have different rules as it relates to urban areas, and that's what we're encouraging the province to do through this letter. So it's just they have the expertise in in preserving the legislation that keeps it a class four and they will work with the developer to ensure that the existing provincial laws will be followed. Yeah, through your worship to Councillor Shaboy, that once again the, in, the intent of this is for sure to make provincial laws are followed, but the provincial laws do allow for some flexibility under the socioeconomic justification clause. So this letter is being prepared to encourage the province to work within their legislation to allow for some modification <laughs> of the existing wetland, which if it, if it was just a strict interpretation, the answer would be no. Okay, Councillor Reggio. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Ryan. Ryan, if my memory serves me right, we're talking about a 35 hectare wetland. I've been asked this question a couple of times and I can't answer it. And it's pretty basic. It's why don't they look at land somewhere else instead of draining part or a portion of, of this wetland? Yeah, through your worship to Councillor Reggio. So the, the one discussion is about the capacity of the wetland, and that's not going to be reduced. So the drainage capacity of, of the wetland is not being reduced. What we're talking about is the area. And then, so there's different, and once again, not the expert in this piece. So there's different ways that you evaluate a wetland. I need the native, native plant solutions guys up here to talk about this piece. But the goal here is not draining the wetland. It's talking about allowing for modification on the boundary edges, which from the classification system are still part of the wetland, but is not part of the, the deep water zone. So it's not part, when you go out there and you look at where the water is right now, that's not the request, is to drain that area. The request here is to allow for development to be considered along the edges where you're modifying some of those other areas or zones of the wetland. And then as part of that, the trade-off is, is to work through the native plant solutions recommendations here, which is, for example, creating another naturalized pond in Bellafield, which is the oversizing pond we were just, Steve was talking about this morning, and creating other naturalized areas that would create the same level of performance or exceed it as the natural wetland currently does. Uh, okay, thank you, but it really didn't answer my question that I've been asked, and the question is, you know, to be quite blunt, why would you want to build on a swamp? Why not just go across the street and buy the land there? I, I know you probably can't answer that. It's a developer's prerogative, but from a city perspective, I'm looking at it. That's yeah, your worship to Councillor Reggio. That's more of a comment than a, 
than, than, than a question. And we went through the whole annexation process. Yeah, no, I understand. And we, we kind of discussed these pieces. And there was all sorts of different requirements to go through the annexation. And some, like, landowners choose to do it, and some landowners chose not to. In this case, the property is still developable. Um, the intent is, once again, not to build on, well, I don't like calling it a swamp, like the, the, the wetland. It's to work within the wetland to still facilitate development and make it an important feature of the development is the intent. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Councillor Cullen and then Councillor Fawcett. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, through you to Mr. Ryan. The, Ryan, I'm, I'm sort of recalling all the different terminologies that uh, that I've seen when they talk about urban settings and, and drainage and retention ponds and those kind of things. And it comes back to my memory, if my memory serves me, it's kind of an engineered compatibility. So as it sits now, it's a slough, which has all those things that, that a slough would have that was not engineered, just comes as a natural habitat. Now it's going to be surrounded by, by homes and other things. So now we're I believe what we're trying to do here is engineer compatibility so that that a it adds to the property values because now you have a water feature in your in the back area and uh, handles all the other things that'll sort of be coming our way which also includes uh, wildlife like as in the ducks and the geese that fly in and and those kind of things so this has all been de dealt in Winnipeg when we did do uh, some of the tours uh, I wasn't involved in this tour that you guys were on, but I was on, involved in another one. And again, they were even these natural grasses, planting the grasses so high on the outside so that it actually creates barriers for the geese not being able to nest there. They don't like the idea of uh, um, something or a predator being able to sneak up on them, so therefore they, they can actually, by doing some of the plantings, they can make it so that it's not the ideal nesting spot or ideal, they can, they can Basically, again, I, I'm, I'm sort of grasping for straws here, but it's a, it's an engineered compatibility so that we actually have a wetland that works within an urban area. And I think this is where where you're going with this. Instead of just sort of letting it do its thing, we're we're being a little more uh, uh, creative in in finding something that works for both the, the habitat and uh, the urban people that would live around it. I think this is, a, this is an up. I think this is what I'm trying to get at. I think that what you're proposing is actually um, uh, creative and also uh, probably more modern than just going in there and thinking that that same wetlands is going to operate the same way as it did before without a little bit of our engineering to help it out. That was a good explanation, and, and it did remind me that, like in Winnipeg, when they had all of those ponds and people all wanted to buy and build the fancy houses on on the ponds and then they had nice lawns right down to the edge nice and flat and then of course the geese came in and the geese walk out and they um, do their business all over the, the lawns and they get huge amounts of complaints over that so then these new ones all these tall grasses the geese are lazy they they can't wander out of the out of the pond up onto the people's uh, yard, so it, it becomes a natural uh, barrier for them doing that, and then the geese could still use the uh, the water, but then they're not coming up on shore to do their business, so it sort of works for everybody. So, uh, Councilor Fawcett? Yes, thank you. Through your words, uh, yeah, lots of geese and turkey droppings talk <laughs> today. Right. So, uh, th there's a lot of detail in this presentation uh, when we read through it. Uh, and, and it does go along the line that we've always been working on and working towards, so I have no issue with uh, agreeing with administration on this particular one. But back to what uh, even Mr. McMillan was talking about earlier, like that uh, retention pond in the other development does play a bigger role in, in all of this. So it is it does go back to that discussion you were going to have with uh, Mr. McMillan about the oversized retention pond, uh, which I can, I can see and I understand uh, the discussion uh, could take place over time. I, I, you know, you could probably phase those, whatever. But it is a large uh, footprint that, uh, that this all comes in from. Like, and I guess in some ways, uh, it's convenient for your, yourself and uh, staff because you do have the same owner 
with large parcels of his properties. Do get to work with them on uh, because that that other piece in the the retention pond isn't even on this annex piece. Retention pond is is in the Bella Field area. Yeah. So just to clarify, through your worship, uh, Councillor Fawcett, it's certainly all part of the same catchment area. So that is convenient when you're dealing with less property owners in one catchment area. In terms of the Bella Field water, though, the that water and runoff from their property is, is going to be dealt with within their pond up in Bellafield with the idea that those flows would be controlled. Controlled from there. Controlled leaving there into this other part of the catchment area. If you go to page 25 of the package, it does show both that you're referring to, Councillor Fawcett. Yeah, page 21. Yeah, that's 25 yeah. of ours, but yeah. Yeah, so I, I do think that in this big picture, and this has been a long, long discussion, you know, with, with this whole annexation and such, and uh, we are aware of that. We're very conscious of the neighbors. I do think uh, we're working with Native Plant Solutions. Uh, and the, the fact that I think that we are, as a collective, the developers, the city, everybody looking at these kind of wetland sites as more of an asset in the long run than just as a deterrent and just, you know, fill them and get going. We now look at them differently. I, I, I think everybody is on the same page on that. I think lots of potentials to win uh, on trying to do this uh, right. So I, I'm, I'm optimistic that your staff will continue to work uh, alongside them to, to get that. Uh, Councilor Shaboy. Uh, thank you, Worship. I guess if I could rewrite the letter, I, it just would be nice if we had, in my opinion, um, add in wording um, that a socioeconomic justification to modify a glass for wetland in an environmentally responsible way would be more comforting to me that they're recognizing we're recognizing the natural habitat that you're developing around i just think it, it's more palatable um, for myself and hopefully for the rest of council that it is considered I don't imagine you'd have an objection to that. That's the spirit of this anyway, so yep. that helps you. I think uh, Mr. Uh, Nickel can add somewhere in there that uh, in an environmentally sound uh, fashion. That's kind of the whole idea of this. Any other uh, questions or suggestions? Seeing none, are you ready for the question? Thank you, Ryan. Sorry, I was just going to... Leave you standing there. Okay, uh, call for the question then. I'm going to get Mr. Brown back up here. Sorry. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried, including Councillor Brown. Next item, please. The application to subdivide 1901 and 1955 31st, 4th Street. Councillor Barry. Thank you, Worship. Just before I read the motion, um, just the point of order or clarification, knowing we're going to have some discussion around a couple of the subjects that Mr. McMillan brought up, would it be better to have those now with our two administration people here and then make the motion because there might be would. some change? Yeah, no, I think it that would. Way. Sometimes it, we go either way and, yeah, let's go ahead and have Can Mr. Nichols come up. Can I that we have, yeah, yeah, members of administration yeah. come up, please? Good idea. Mr. Nickel and Mr. Kulak, welcome, gentlemen. Yeah, through your worship, uh, Council. So, Mr. McMillan spoke to this uh, and the concerns. So, I'm, I'm really just going to highlight the concern pieces of this for now. Um, overall, and sometimes we always get caught up on kind of the pieces that are we're having trouble with, but. You know, the other 98% of this is kind of seems to be moving forward. So that's a positive piece. And it is just the next stage of Bellafield consistent with the neighborhood plan. And so the overall piece is certainly acceptable to administration and the planning commission. And that's why the recommendation to, is to approve it. And later on this agenda, you'll be considering the rezoning for second and third reading. And certainly we don't have any quick questions with that. There's no conditions. But just like anything, kind of the devil's in the details. 
And uh, with these types of developments, there's always going to be some details to work through. So starting out with the pieces that were raised by Mr. McMillan. Um, sorry, before I get to that, I'm jumping the gun. To clarify the recommendation, the recommendation from this is to defer this application. That was the recommendation of the Planning Commission, and administration supports that request. And that comes before it. So it's kind of confusing when you read it, but if you read the first statements, it says prior to council giving conditional approval, which is what council's considering right now, that the developer submit the required information for administration to calculate oversizing contributions, and then this item would come back for council, and those items that are X'd out right now on, under development condition 1A would be filled in with those recommended contributions as per council's approved oversizing parameter. As always, we're really trying to work with the developer to move this through the process. We don't want to be a barrier to development, uh, but in the same sense, we're still tasked with ensuring compliance with city bylaws and parameters. And in this case, uh, the parameter which was prepared in consultation with the industry, I say consulted, not agreed to. Like sometimes we consult and it's not universally agreed to. And this was brought forward for approval by city council and it was approved along with the amendment to the secondary plan. And part of that requirement was, was that when the next stage of development was coming, we need to ensure compliance with current city bylaws, parameters, policies, the things administration should do. And part of that is the oversizing. It has been a very difficult process, like just like trying anything new for the first time. Sometimes things seem to work really good in theory and then in practice, they just don't go so well. So it's evident that we're having some troubles, administration and the developer working through this, because why else would we not have this ironed out before going to council? I don't think they want to do that, and certainly we don't want to do that going to council. But the hope is, is that over the next two weeks or so, we can get the information from the developer, council meets in three weeks, to bring something forward to council where we can have a discussion. If council did choose to move forward, of course, council can make whatever choices they'd like to. Council would be moving forward in contravention of one of their adopted parameters for administration. And there's more implications than that just on this property owner, because of course we always deal with multiple property owners in these areas. And the original process where we brought this forward involved multiple other property owners in some previous approvals. So there's always a temptation to kind of kick it down the line to, to deal with it later. And that certainly council, respect council's right purview in the process. But the recommendation from the administration is to get the information to deal with this, with this now. So having discussions about the tree contributions and the development charges right now, from administration's perspective is a little bit premature. We would, we would hope council provide that initial recommendation to Acquire the information, and then we'll come back to a council meeting when the information is available. Once that information is available, of course, the council will have the ability to make a decision and move the, the subdivision forward. Are there any questions? This is a weird one. I, I know this isn't ideal from anyone's perspective. Go ahead, Councilor Barry. Thank you, Worship. Um, yeah, if it's a weird one, is right. Um, but by basically deferring it and waiting for it to come back again, then we're delaying it, which is what the developer doesn't want. They want to get moving on this. They don't want to delay it any longer. So based on the presentation he's giving and listening to you, what you're saying is everything in here is recommended by administration, but there are some things in here that, uh, for example, the trees uh, basically says the city will plant them and reimburse them. I know that's one area that, honestly, if he wants to do it, let them as far as I'm concerned. But we'd have to change that in here now before we pass the motion, would we not? Yeah, through your worship to Councillor uh, Barry, any of the changes you would have to make in the, like this is the recommendation of the Planning Commission based right. on city adopted policies and procedures. Of course, you could change this, but from an administration perspective, we'd want to be hesitant to making just a bunch of changes without understanding the implications on like working with other 
customers coming in through the through the process. It always seems like a small change when you're just making it for one, but when we're making it for one, make it for all. There's yeah, a, there's yeah a lot fair is fair, right? At. Yeah, that's understandable. But just to follow up your worship, yeah. then. So on that basis, if we don't change anything in this document that's being presented to us tonight, everything that he's presented tonight, is he out of luck with that then? We basically listen to his presentation, but no, nothing's getting changed? Or do we need to do it now? What do we need to do is what I'm asking. Yeah, through your worship to Councillor Barry, what we're recommending you do is simply pass the motion, which is the first paragraph there, recommendations start that stops with condition A. So what, what we're saying is you're not making, our recommendation is not to make a decision on this at this meeting, is to refer it back, require the information from the developer so we can calculate oversizing, and we'll come back at a future meeting where we'll have all this discussion about all these other pieces, and City Council can choose which conditions they'd like to modify and which ones they'd like to leave as is. But the recommendation, it's premature because there's a, there's a, Council adopted parameter, which is in place for a good reason, is to ensure the information regarding costs is a, first off, like a transparent public process that everybody knows, which is, and is, you know, out publicly. It ensures compliance with the parameter moving forward, and the city needs that information to calculate the costs with other developers. So we agree with Steve, and not everything he's saying, of course, is incorrect, the devil's in the details later on, but up front, conceptually, we do need to know the numbers because when we get other development applications coming in, we're calculating contributions from them, which ultimately those funds will pay back the city for funds that we're compensating VBJ. So this is a really complicated technical piece. The hope is, is that this item would be deferred to a future a meeting requiring the information, and then we'd really walk council through it. And of course, the other developer would have a chance to speak. Go ahead one more time. Yep. Then I got just Cameron and Chaboye. Just yeah. one real quick one then. Can you get this all done and everything back to us by June 1st by our next meeting then? Through your worship to Councilor Barry, that's the one I cringe at because a lot of it's outside of our control. There's two parties involved here. Certainly that's the intent, to bring it back for, for the next meeting to have council make a decision. Okay, thank you. Okay, I've got Councillors Cameron, Shiboye, and Fawcett so far. Thank you, Your Worship. Through you to Mr. Nickel and Mr. Pulak. Um, my question is, is a bit around the development charge, and I know you did want to talk about that at a later date, but it, it, it bears some merit to what we're talking about as far as some of the un... Um, the unknown numbers thus far. I know Mr. McMillan had mentioned in, in sort of taking this as one big shot, 75 uh, lots to be developed, and in the hopes of um, deferring some of that development charge to two years down the road. My question is, is, is there any benefit either to the city or to the developer to go in one big piece like that as opposed to going to uh, 25, 25, 25? Reason being is I don't want to be in a position where potentially anybody that's developing a property could say, you know what, I'll, I'll bite off more right now and then just sort of bank it on the future. Um, I just want to make sure that there isn't, a, there isn't a benefit in approaching it this way, dollar value versus biting off as much as you can take on at the time. Yeah, three worship to Councillor Cameron. Always going to be the recommendation of city, well, not always, but primarily to follow the bylaws, which is what's adopted to have consistency in terms of application. So in this case, we can, of course, city council can choose to phase a development charge, but then the next applicant that comes in will for sure expect the same treatment. And the next one, like, that's just the way these things work. And then by that time, it's our preference that city council would have just amended the bylaw which provides the <coughs> direction. Because if we were going to start phasing development charges, we should probably change the bylaw and then that's communicated, transparent and consistent for, for everybody through the process. Also, when we go through these processes and we defer conditions and requirements, and I know it's always really tempting to do so, I like to do that sometimes because you just can't seem to get through something. There's different points in the process that provide the ability to get things done. When you defer them past that point, it's really hard to get things done. 
So under a subdivision, that means you add it as a condition of approval, it gets done before final approval. If something's deferred, just like say Councillor Loreggio, like six, eight months, that's really hard because you, you lose the ability to get that piece. There's a reason why planning set up with conditions and all the conditions get fulfilled before the subdivision registered because at that point in time, the applicant's very motivated to get things done because they got to check out all the boxes or they can't sell lots. But if we defer things out past that, that creates a real challenge for administration to work with applicants to get, to get things done. So the goal here is by hopefully having this information now and available, we can deal with it now. There was a recommendation for the Planning Commission that had us recommending this be deferred after the conditional approval because we knew this conversation was coming up. But at that meeting, the de developer spoke and their piece was, well, we don't want to come back to council in, in the future on this same application. We're already doing that now as part of the process. And the Planning Commission heard them and they said, well, you're right. We like, go through the process and then come back. Doesn't seem to make sense. So they decided to forward this on the Planning Commission with a different recommendation, which wasn't to defer this thing past is to let's get the information now. And once again, this is really difficult because the developer's not here and I think it's only fair that they're here to speak to it. And that's why if we, if we bring it back to a future meeting, they can kind of speak, speak to their piece as well. But their request here was that they were looking to have it deferred to a future application, not this application. The request was it would be dealt with when there was an amendment to the Southwest Secondary Plan that included those lands to the, to the south. So administration's recommendation is no, there's a, there's a bylaw in place right now and an adopted parameter. Certainly agreements can be amended and those types of things, but for us to comply, it needs to be dealt with under this request. Thank you. And Councillor Shaboye, then Councillor Fawcett. Great, thanks. I'm just trying to get my head around the functionality of, of this request. Now, oversizing, um, you're saying then that the next developer could come along and put in X number of apartment blocks and you want to be reassured that the correct large pipes are in place for that development and that developer will pay but this development you're reassuring that it's okay for them to have a regular size pipe in there but it might, all those apartment blocks might impact the development. Are you protecting us this way with allowing him to proceed with per se a regular smaller size pipe and then down the road other developers come in and put in large apartment blocks and the requirement will be to have oversized piping. Yeah, three, three worship to council. So we don't have to pay for it, and at the same time, our citizens will be protected that there is enough capacity for sewage and everything else to run through this development with the smaller pipes. Yeah, three worship to Councillor Shaboy. I should have, maybe I was trying to avoid the whole presentation today, but I had some, some images that show how it works. And, and it's not so much that apartments are the problem because this is, we're talking about land drainage here. So it's more about how much of the area is hard surfaced. And the more area that's hard surfaced, the more water that runs off of it. So in terms of this exercise, there's assumptions made about different land uses based on the secondary plan and there's different runoff percentages. But you're right in the fact that the city's interest here and the reason why we brought on oversizing, it's in the city's advantage not to have individual property owners each develop their own ponds on their properties that become often city infrastructure we go and maintain and we do all of these things where it makes sense that if you have a larger area and, and there's a larger pond for that pond just to simply be made slightly bigger and the, pond, the, the pipes going to the pond slightly bigger and then these other areas that are often smaller just a few lots here and there they will just drain to the pond and when they come in and develop they pay a contribution that contribution is paid to the city. So the reason why we need to know those funds here is when we're working actively with other developers coming in, we need to know which percent of their contribution they pay to the city because ultimately the city will be the one paying for the oversizing 
that this developer is putting in. Okay. Okay, Councilor Fawcett. Yes, thank you, Through Your Worship. Uh, I just quickly, so why why do we have this here now and not in two weeks from now? Did we just not think we could get this uh, kind of done in two weeks, or it doesn't seem to be a complete piece here? Like, uh, no, through your worship to Councillor Fawcett, the, the preference certainly wasn't to bring it to this meeting. Uh, there was a hope that working through the applicant, we could have this stuff ironed out before this meeting and I could run out here with a solution and pass out the paperwork and say, hey, here it is, let's keep the process going. Um, that didn't happen, unfortunately, which is why it's on the agenda for council and we're asking for a resolution <clears throat> simply to defer it until some other information is received. Okay, again, uh, thank you, and th th through your worship again. Um, now, on a lot of these, we do get the, uh, you know, uh, everything's be approved subject to owner or successor, uh, agreeing to all those sort of different things. Like, that's not an uncommon thing for us to do. Uh, approving some of this stuff with little modifications, does that not sort of also still then hold that you do have to agree before it goes ahead? Yeah, that's how I thought this was heading. Uh, that didn't. I missed that part about the that prior to the first. Yeah. yeah. So through your worship to Councillor Fawcett, from a timing perspective, the development agreement gets entered into with the information we have right now. So it's an agreement between the city and developer. From the parameter, the way it's written, it's important to understand magnitude of costs because city council would be approving those. Although they're approximate costs, they're still going to be, you know, plus minus 15% of the final costs. So if we proceeded now and there was no numbers in there, we don't really, because it's, it just goes on and it can be determined later. And I'm not saying there's not different approaches here, but the, the goal of it was to make it a transparent upfront process where the numbers are known going in. There's all sorts of ways, if that's the role of council, where if, where we can push this thing off, like, and, and get it done. Like I've, come up with recommendations that would push it off before the certificate of approval. And like, of course, full disclosure, we're always prepared to come to meetings with different options. But once again, it's difficult because the developer can't speak for themselves right now. But going in, the understanding of the deferral of the developer was not, not as much, of course, they want to push it down, but it's to defer it to another process where if city council could defer it to, let's say, get it done before the certificate approval and have it come back. But I don't know if that's meeting the intent of what the developer's really looking for with this anyways. Yeah, so, so follow up again. Thank you, through your worship. So, because the, 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 like, it's a big, like, these are big processes. And it seems like a lot of I's are dotted and T's are crossed here. There's, there is some bigger pieces we need to still address. The tree thing, the grand scheme of things seems pretty small you get between us and the developer we could figure out how to get the city to put them in faster or, or, or whoever their contracts are or such or or kind of come up with a deal after the fact that you know we look at that whole piece uh, that's not the end of the world um, now the payment again these are sort of I guess some of the bigger things like uh, Budget wise, if you could kind of go with uh, that first piece and then uh, two years later they kind of said, you know, I guess they would pay the other portion uh, without any kind of stipulation as to if it was developing or not. Well, we can budget that pretty easy. We know when it's coming and what's going on there. Now, does it mean we have to change everything going forward? I, I, I don't know. I don't know what that means. Uh, the oversized. And again, you explain this a little bit because it isn't a full oversizing of everything. It sounds like it's mostly the retention areas and the drainage. That is the, so it's the, that it's not, because I, I had asked, I think, maybe I asked Mr. McMillan, the oversizing though, the, that infrastructure going into that area is no point in that. It's, you're the end of the line. Mm -hmm. So what's the point in oversizing any of that? So it is about the drainage in the long term picture. And, you know, obviously the end result is this oversized pond, like at the end of development. 
It, it has to be if, at the end of development of the whole area, likely. Uh, can those things not be phased? Like, uh, I don't understand that completely. Like, it, we probably did need a little bit more of a session on, on some of this, but can you not phase retention stuff? I guess the pipe in the ground is going to be the pipe in the ground. You have to put large pipe in the ponds themselves. As long as it's all supposed to be retention pond, could you not only build to what you need at the time while putting the land out there to do it all? Yeah, through your worship to Councillor Fawcett, these are all really good questions, and if, if we were a little bit more prepared to like hash this out in detail, that would be the thing, is to put the actual presentation yeah. and, and, and walk Council through all that. That's why it's really hard, because the, the recommendation here was for kind of the deferral piece. In short, the applicant's correct. All, in, all stormwater management infrastructure will be phased. The pond, by us asking for the conceptual numbers as part of this development agreement, does not mean the pond will be fully built out within this development agreement. What this means is that we will have the conceptual design submitted, which is what we're asking for here, and some costing assigned to that. To understand the difference between the cost, if the developer was to build the development without taking in any other areas, and the cost of, and the infrastructure improvements required to oversize, which means these other areas, part of the catchment area, are going to the pond. And by conceptually knowing those numbers and putting them in here, there's a commitment going both ways that when we work through this process, because it holds both parties into account, that we're going to work, the city will work to take contributions from other groups moving forward. So it's not that we need all the infrastructure constructed right now. It's we need the conceptual information to understand the costing. And, and that's what's being asked for as part of this recommendation. Okay, thank you, through your worship. Just continuing on that, so I, I uh, so I'm understanding that. Like, it's it just seems that we just don't have the numbers in there. That's like Correct. those numbers. That's sort of unfortunate that they're not in there because they are just conceptual. Uh, so, uh, through your worship, to Councillor Fawcett, um, It's been said a couple of times, this is a complicated process because we are talking conceptual, we're talking about catchment areas, we're talking about lands that may not get developed for 10 years. And so we're trying to design to an end goal that is an estimation to our best, to, to our best guess for the most part. And we come up, what we're asking them is from a conceptual point of view, and we have all this data, can you produce a design that allows us to put a cost, an incremental cost to oversizing this so that we can then turn around to developers who are benefiting from this infrastructure that we can go back and charge them for it. So in the end, I mean, the entire goal of the oversizing policy was to ensure that the developer where, who's taking on the oversizing is not taking on any incremental cost. That's what we're trying to ensure, that we're oversizing the infrastructure, we pay for those incremental costs, and then we endeavor to recover those from other developers who are benefiting from those. From those, In this case, we're talking about drainage and retention pond. Okay, I have myself next, and then Councillor uh, Cullen, I'm going to see if I can help to pull this together a little bit, but I may just confuse it more. So. <laughs> Um, so on one hand, the, the, the oversizing issue has been well described as a complicated thing, very forward-looking, uh, you know, considering developments that might be built in the next 10 years and so on and so forth. So I, I would be dubious that then we're going to pull all that big complicated ball of wax um, together in for two or three weeks from now. So, you know, I, I, I feel like it might be just um, um, an unreasonable expe expe expectation on the part of council of administration and the developer to be able to get all this together so that we're better off um, early June to now just make the de decision. I, I, it, it just seems to me like just a much, much bigger 
uh, complicated thing and you probably want to do it right and so I, I think it's unrealistic to think that that piece whereas you know Ryan opened the conversation with 98 percent of the thing is all laid on Councilor Poss said I's dotted T's crossed you know we're kind of ready to go I'm also mindful of our kind of construction seasons uh, around here and we're we're kind of into it and and um, I expect the developer wants to get going with the you know with the the infrastructure portions of this I mean they're not selling the lots uh, uh, next month but they need to get underway with the with the construction and they probably don't want to get held up I I don't know that for a fact but I suspect that's a consideration so I, I uh, and and then the the last piece I was going to say is that um, not terribly usual normally we would be having this uh, discussion about a thing that they would have to pay us and therefore we're not signing until we've got an agreement of till what we're getting paid this one is kind of the other way around as I as I would understand it like what the X's the blank spots are this are what the developer the developer is going to be required to oversize uh, bits of infrastructure and in compensation for doing so because they're oversizing on behalf of future developers so in in compensation for them um, doing that oversizing they're going to get paid back for that so the as I would understand the the numbers that are left blank is what they're going to get paid back so frankly uh, if anybody really has the onus of wanting to slow down and say, hold on, I'm not signing anything until I know what I'm getting paid for this, that would be the developer. Like, we're not really as much in risk here as they are. And so I'd be interested to know, and it sounds like Ryan, as he always does, and Patrick, kind of another card up your sleeve um, when we get uncooperative, um, it, it, like what other measure we could have that we can just kind of still keep moving this on, give everyone more time to properly figure out this oversizing uh, calculation, and that that you know is is uh, approved at a future date, and yet there's some other you said some kind of a certificate of approval, almost like. You know, we're not giving you a building permit on any of these lots. Uh, is another one that comes to mind until that is complete. You know, so we we, we always have other kind of hammers uh, in our toolbox that we can use. While at the same time letting the process keep going. So, forgive me if I haven't made things more clear. Um, try to. And then yeah, I'll let no, to, call in. to your worship. Um, you did do a good job of kind of summing this piece up. Uh, from a process perspective, if we were, if council did want to move it forward, uh, the alternative recommendation from administration, of course, not our recommendation. Our recommendation is have this addressed in accordance with the parameter. Would be that this. We're not saying we don't want to address it. We're just saying that you address it. At a, yeah, it would be to address it before we issue the certificate of approval. So from a developer's perspective, once the development agreement is executed, that means all the detailed design work submitted, which in this case would still include oversizing, that's still the requirement. But the actual cost piece, those X's here, would come back to council before the new lots are registered. So that's when we talk about like the triggers, that means the developer cannot sell lots before the we sign off the certificate. So that's enough ability for us to get something done. What it does from a developer's perspective is that it allows us to go forward and have the agreement executed, which allows them to start putting infrastructure in the property. So once again, it's hard because the developer's not here, and I don't know if that completely serves their interest, but it does let them get started with construction with the understanding that we'd still have to work through this piece and report back to council on this missing portion. And it would sound to me like, because again, that's not imminent, like the, the provision you've just laid out, that is likely many months down the road. Yeah, through your worship. So giving giving everyone takes, lots of time to... 
Yeah, giving everybody lots of time to get this thing worked out properly. Yeah, through your worship, it usually doesn't happen quicker than four months at least between conditional approval and final acceptance. So wouldn't that really accommodate everybody then? Yeah, through your worship, I certainly have wording available if that's something council wants to do as part of the process. And, and this just deals with the one issue. This just deals with the oversizing issue. There's a couple other ones on the uh, on the plate, but I won't hog the mic because Councillor Cullen has hand up so for all I know he's got a even better solution. Um, yeah. no Thank pressure. you your worship I don't <laughs> think that you're going to uh, find that I'm sorting things out I just uh, the more that uh, we go around the more confused I'm getting. The the I'm trying to figure out just even some of the basics you're looking for information from the developer to fill in those holes that's right He's saying, or at least what I thought I heard him say, is that because he's not the only developer, he can't give you all that information. Or he he's planned this particular portion of that subdivision, but really he hasn't put a lot of time into the other ones. So therefore, like, uh, it, it could go a whole bunch of different directions. So then basically it comes down to city administration saying, this is the size of pipe that we're going to need in here that we think for future development and he's got to sign off on it and say that that's okay so that'll limit his um, ability to develop up upstream right it's like so and I don't I, I'm struggling too because of, you know the, the little amount of plumbing that I do but I mean there's only they, it goes up in increments it's not like it's uh, you know it's either two or two and a half or three or three and a half or four it's like it's not like it's uh, you know where you're going with this you know that you need to be oversized really what are we talking about like why can't we figure this out I'm struggling that we can't figure this out to the, the, the point if he wants to be safe we want to be safe and the difference between this size of pipe and this size of pipe is that amount and we're putting it in there for future development so I, I'm struggling with why this information is so hard to get. Yeah, through your worship, uh, to Council Colin, I think one of the pieces where we're struggling is because this is the first time we've gone through it. And just like anything you go through the first time, it's been a learning experience. There's been a lot of responsibility placed on the developer and the developer's engineer to do the design work for this. Um, in hindsight, that could be looked at in the future because it certainly added a lot of extra back and forth to the process. Um, but we're trying to ensure compliance with that right now. And there's been definitely some, some challenges navigating that. I don't think, and I don't think, I don't, hopefully the developer doesn't think this is excessively complicated. Like none of this is. It's just about getting the information and putting council in a position to make a decision. And we don't have that information right now. Just to add to that is that Ryan touched on it. Is that uh, it's not it, it's not complicated. It's just that in order to proceed, you have to have you can't view it as a single point in time. You have to view it as a whole. And again, Ryan touched on it where he said this is the first time we've gone through this process. And there's certainly it's like learning to walk for the first time. There's things, as Ryan said where we put a lot of that responsibility on the developer and their consultant, I think maybe next time we would look at doing it ourselves. So, um, you know, it, it's, and, and also coming to agreement on just what are the constraints within that, within that catchment area or development or developments in this case. I mean, it sounds so simple, but it's actually, to come to an agreement on it is, is more difficult than than, than you would think. Okay, well, I've got uh, now signifying councillors Barry, Parker, and Fawcett. Now, that'd be round two for Barry and, and Fawcett, but um, it is Councillor Barry's award and motion. If you had a solution, would, uh, I don't know whether Councillor Parker would uh, uh, just. Uh, I can be quick. Okay, you go ahead and then we'll go to Councillor Barry. Yeah, thank you. Your Worship, through you to uh, whoever. Ryan, Patrick, somebody. Um, 
So I'm, I'm sitting here thinking along the lines of the mayor that you usually have a hat and you pull a rabbit out of it and we can move on when we get into some of these complicated ones. So I'm, I was hoping that there was a solution where we could kind of move on and the developer could start working a little bit and we could get this thing all sorted out. Um, I don't think in, in my memory that we've had a problem um, coming up with a solution with this developer uh, in any previous times. I mean, there's always been a solution come out of these, these situations and, and we've moved on. So I don't see that being a big issue. And, and I think this sort of ties into when we first started talking development fees, we talked about it's not so much the first project we're doing, it's the one that's down that causes the issue. And so that's the whole oversizing thing. And this is a prime example of why development fees were needed in the first place was to cover the extra infrastructure costs and those types of things. So anyway, I'm hoping that you have a plan that we can work with this developer and get them moving on the project and, uh, and you know, and while, of course, ensuring that you don't have a flood of significant issues come out of this from, from future developers as well. So thank you, Councillor Parker. Uh, Councillor Barry. Uh, thank you, Worship. I'm actually going to request a little bit of an unorthodox method of dealing with this right now. If I've have received a text from the presenter, what we had earlier tonight, and I'm hearing a lot of conversation of we're trying to get answers, trying to find an amicable way to deal with this. And I've heard it come up a couple times that we wish the presenter was here to talk. So I've actually asked him if he can get his butt down here pretty quick. But in doing that, can we maybe, we have not put a motion on the table on this yet. Can we maybe push it aside for now, deal with a few other of the bylaw uh, readings we have to do tonight with the hopes that this can come down and we can come back to it? When I think it's just a minutes, motion of council to uh, lay it change on the, the table. Yeah. And then bring it back when you want to. Yeah, but well, we don't really even have it on the table other than no, we have to just No, we don't. The, uh, it's, uh, there's motion. no motion on the table. Just uh, uh, amend the order of the agenda, right? Oh. Do we even need a motion for that? Okay. But basically, it was just an opportunity for him to possibly, if he gets us to come down and, and we can get some more clarification. And if he doesn't, then we can come back to it and deal with it later. Then. Okay. So you believe he is on his way? I'm waiting to hear back, but I I haven't got a message back yet. All right. Well, it won't make any difference if we, uh, uh, we got quite a number of other things to right. deal with. So yeah, that's what I was looking at with the agenda. Bang a few of those off. And I realize the, uh, this is out of order, but it's, it's is back your call. Uh, so. we can. Uh, does everyone generally in agree with that? Uh, we're just going to pause this. Uh, we haven't got a motion on the floor yet or anything, so we'll. Yeah, just a point of order, though. Just to, for clarity's sake, uh, we don't usually have uh, people speak at the meeting. So I'm just curious, are we overstepping our own bounds? Like it's not a public hearing. There was an opportunity to speak. I'm asking this at the mayor's discretion. Yeah, okay. his, his call. So we have that. Well, again, it belongs to the whole body here. I mean, if everybody would rather, you know, I'm sort of prepared to go with Plan B, like uh, Councilor Parker was asking about. You know, it sounds like Ryan has a Plan B. I don't. I don't think. Again, I, I like things not to be that complicated. It just doesn't sound that complicated to me that we pass. Um, this the, the developer keeps going the piece about the oversizing is separated out to continue to working on it and we've got another mechanism to ensure compliance uh, with getting an agreement on it uh, you know again it's even worse like he, now he's going to go ahead and do all the work put in all the instruction uh, um, uh, infrastructure and he can't sell a lot uh, until he completes the the uh, this one piece of the agreement so it's kind of the same you know we, we still always have the same hammer so I don't know if that would be whatever you wish you I don't know what you know again it's your ward would that not be as suitable that is the way it was kind of leaning yeah when okay. after hearing about uh, the possible plan B well I just want to ask one more time because I, I put a great deal of difference in our administration uh, especially on these extremely complicated ones and you know I think council would really need to hear you know we know what your first choice of of uh, uh, recommendations is and then sort of your second choice is is this latter uh, 
parking, the oversizing. Um, you know, do do we really feel that we're putting the city in any kind of jeopardy by doing it that way? Like, I mean, we we still have the um, you know the administrative clout, uh, the uh, regulatory clout to in, ensure that that is um, completed. Um, so before we propose that, it's sure like, you know, Ryan and Patrick's, you know, point of view on that. I'll go. Well, I think I'm asking the question, so we'll uh, see what Ryan has to say. Yes, through your worship, uh, coming in tonight, I was worried it was going to be one of these, and I was kind of hoping to keep it a little bit simpler, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> if it was the will of council, as we talked about, you could swap out that first paragraph with the condition that says that prior to the issuance of a certificate of approval, the owner shall submit all required information demonstrating compliance with the oversized infrastructure and development agreement parameter for consideration by city council. So that means that if that was the decision, the development agreement would be entered into. Some of the infrastructure could start being installed as per the agreed development agreement. But prior to the lots being registered and sold, this information would have to come, this would still have to come back to council. Well, again, from my point of view, that sounds like a reasonable approach gives both I'm thinking both of administration and the um, applicant that is going to give you certainly many more weeks to puzzle out what sounds like a little bit of a complicated thing if it was really that easy I mean you would have been rushing in here with the solution uh, and this will kind of give you the the opportunity and yet for the developers point of view I mean they, they still are uh, feet is still to the fire. I mean, they, they still have to complete uh, that work or else they're not going to get too far. They're going to put all this infrastructure in and can't sell a lot. So, uh, Councilor Fawcett? Yes, thank you, through your worship. Uh, I, I'm in agreement with what uh, his worship is, is saying on this uh, and had wanted to hear what Ryan had as his plan B piece in there, which he said he did have. Uh, I, I'm comfortable with that. I think that that is more realistic than bringing this back in two weeks with with numbers in there and that. It just doesn't seem like that would be the case. Otherwise, they'd be in there now. Uh, and, you know, let's take into consideration this is the first that we've put, one we've put on here. And, and to add to it, it's quite a large one and a little bit more complex than some. And, and I think it does give us good opportunity to review. You know, like, you know, our first plan may not have been perfect. Uh, maybe we do need to review this a little bit after we can come out with it after, as Mr. Pulak had mentioned, maybe there's some things we need to do more on the city's end and other, uh, uh, so I, I, I'm in agreement with his worship on, on approaching it this way. I will ask just sort of quick in passing, uh, and I will, I'm not going to lose sleep on these, uh, the tree piece and the, uh, that payment piece, like, uh, the two year, uh, pay up front now and then the two year. Is there any in your plan B anything that, that stipulates that kind of accommodation, or is that something we can accommodate? Uh, after I sort of felt, yeah, we had three things to deal with. We're really talking about the oversizing piece, and then we've got the other two requests. <clears throat> the one seems more uh, financial, and we can maybe see how that works out. I, I, um, like if there's accommodations we need to make in this and that or and the the piece with the trees you know i think that that's something we could look at uh, overall on what we're doing with that and we could probably come up with some agreement after the fact you know or you know have the city do it on a tighter timeline or whatever but uh, this seems to be the big piece but i am concerned about that payment piece too how does that affect us yes yeah, through your worship to councillor fawcett Similar to the developer, I don't think the trees is the one the city wants to yeah. die on here. No, not on this either. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we've seen 
PBJ plant trees. They seem to do a good job of planting the trees. It's same for, more for us, it's more or less we want to try to, to when we're making changes, make them to like parameters and policies and bring them forward so they're consistent for everyone instead of just doing kind of a thing one off suddenly you change and maybe you don't look at the implications enough. So really it's not fighting that one hard. That's just the preference is to follow current practice when we're going through the development agreement parameters, which we have been for a while now, hopefully wrap that up, have a new way of planting trees in new neighborhoods and where we work with some other groups. So that's the tree piece. Uh, the development charge piece, once again, it's council adopted bylaw. We certainly recommend council follow the bylaw. The developer could have applied for smaller phases. It wasn't a city requirement that made them apply for 75 lots. They could have applied for half of those lots and then they would have been only charged the development charge on the lots they applied for. Um, they chose to move forward. However, of course, we always have options ready for council. If council wanted to phase development charges, our recommendation is you wouldn't just do 50-50 and charge the other 50% in two years, you would charge them 50% of the rate that it would apply in two years. So it's not a cost savings piece. So if the council understands, so if the development charge is adjusted in two years where it goes up because of the cost of construction increases, the developer would pay the charge at the year they're paying the charge. It's not, there's not an advantage, just just splitting the current value charge. That's the same recommendation that was put forward for the mobile home park that council once again, phased the development charge contribution. You see a pattern here, right? Phase charge, phase charge, things mend the bylaw, but these things come forward, but that, that would be administration's recommendation. It would be the same as we brought forward before. See, you hit it on the head. Glenn, he always has a hat, and he's always got some rabbits to pull out of it. Um, okay, so there, there are three pieces to this, and uh, for expediency, um, I might need the city clerk's uh, help here because um, we, we, we want to be able to deal with this motion. Um, it would be easier if we, if we uh, consider each of the three pieces and, and then have them contained in the, in the final motion. So, um, or we take a stab at one motion that contains what someone thinks we want as an outcome. I think Councillor Barry knows. Better take a stab at that. I can try, but I'm really going to need some help here on this because I think the motion... Well, if you, if you just sort of enunciate what you think it um, is without reading the whole thing out and then administration can uh, kind of polish it up for us. It would be like oversizing would be plan B, which he just right, said. Right, um, Trees, whatever you think, and uh, the payment uh, could be his. Because it will have to do with the uh, certificate of approval, deferral of that, based on uh, what we were talking about. The deferral to certificate of approval to work in, in future, right. and that is one of the, and that's the piece I'm already. trying to put together. How do I work it out here? So, so, so that's the number one, this, okay. this one here. Okay. All right, Your Worship, then I'll make the motion that uh, prior to the issuance of the certificate of approval, the owner or successor submit all required information demonstrating compliance with the oversized infrastructure and development reimbursement parameter for consideration by City Council. Then, Ryan, just go into the regular motion then, or? To your worship, uh, there was the idea of dealing with each of these as the, of their own one at a time. Does that still work better for well, whatever council wants to do? It's just it's a big. In my apologies. So is this supposed to be number one on replacement or number one on here? Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, uh, through your worship, uh, there's no numbers on it, but it would replace the first paragraph of the recommendation. So the first paragraph of the recommendation that says that this whole thing should be deferred would be replaced by the condition that prior to the certificate of approval, this information is provided to the city. The second portion of that is the development agreement. So it's to, uh, the second piece is to approve the subdivision request subject to the development agreement that has those conditions attached to it. And then we can play with the conditions Correct. if we... Correct, so then you can start talking about the conditions of the development agreement. 
My apologies, Your Worship. I don't know if I'm looking at the same thing, but I don't see anywhere in this motion where it says that we should defer this. I've looked at it several times. Yeah, that's what kind of... Well, it says that prior to the City Council giving conditional approval... Prior the, board. Yeah, so we're taking kind of that out. Right. Well, now, now it's instead of prior to it giving it conditional approval of subject, now it's the prior to council giving, there's a new term, what is it? Issuance of the certificate of approval. Right. Right. That's yeah. the one. That's yeah, what that's I'm asking. Your that word? Word. Correct. Councilor Berry, that first paragraph is the one that I was referring to as a deferral. Okay. Because it says, <laughs> it says prior to making this decision right. that we're talking about right now, right. you would need this information. So what you've done is you've taken that out and you've replaced okay. it with the motion. Okay. So basically what you've given me is all I need for that opening paragraph. Correct. And now okay. you're moving into the next piece, which is that you're here is to approve the subdivision subject to the development agreement and and then the discussion around the conditions. Okay. We can try this again, Your Worship. Yep. Your Worship. Okay. Um, Your Worship, I'd like to move that uh, prior to the issuance of certificate of approval, the owner or successor submit all required information demonstrating compliance with the oversight of infrastructure and developer reimbursement parameter for consideration by City Council. And that, and further, do we need this? And then starting that out, and then see. The, the application to subsub, to, to, sorry, to subdivide 1901 and 1955 34th Street to create 75 lots and public roads in the residential single detached and parks and recreation zones be approved subject to the owner or successor. Uh, number one, the owner successor entering into a development agreement with the City of Brandon to be registered in a series with the subdivision with the following conditions. Um, Your Worship, I'd rather not read all the conditions, but maybe just change the ones that we've been talking about, if that's okay. Yeah. As there is actually quite a few. Yeah. Um, we've dealt with 1A, which is the oversized uh, infrastructure dealing with the secondary plan, so I'll leave that. That sounds correct, Madam Clerk. Okay, so we're talking about the conditions of the development agreement now? Yes. Correct? And so, mm -hmm. just confirm, so... Sorry, Your Worship, were we going to deal with the conditions separately? Or as well, he's going to, we're taking a stab at... Taking a stab at, <laughs> at, uh, at uh, laying it all on there once, and if not, then we'll take amendments. Yeah. Okay, so... Um, so it'll be sort of all the conditions as, as listed with as the listed exception, of, exception of changing. I'm going to change a couple here on yeah. you. Um, the developer will uh, plant 105 boulevard trees at the approval of city administration instead of paying the cash and new contribution for those trees. However, that's to be worded. And that was item and F. E. That was E. e. Oh, sorry. F. F? Yep, good. Um, I'm not changing K, which is the development cost charges. I'm leaving it. That's, okay. again, my recommendation, but. That's pretty much the only changes I have there. And if we get a seconder, then we'll okay. get it to Councillor Lupke. Thank you very much, Councillor Barry. So hopefully everybody understands. Now we all have a discussion, and then we can also accept amendments to any other twist that any other member of council, but at least we got something to start with on the table. So Councillor Reggio. Uh, thank you. Just a point of clarification. Point G then, the developer will be required to provide landscaping plan for the trees and the city will determine species to be determined by the city at the time of planting that stays that's yeah, that stays yeah. there okay thank you because we still want to provide yep. the, that yeah, and the that species and all that earlier, so yeah. okay so first of all everybody pretty much understands <clears throat> what's now on the table and so of the we've got kind of the oversizing you know kind of a plan b we've uh, conceded on the trees and then Councillor Barry's motion 
leaves full payment of the development co cost charges at it, as is. <coughs> Somebody wants to propose an amendment about that if they feel differently, you're welcome to do that. If not, that's what's on the table. Discussion, questions? I did have one question. Um, complicate things and the fellows have sat down on the trees and it does seem uh, and, I, and I agree with the the, the motion that Councillor Barry's made uh, basically to, to uh, um, fall in line with the request but I am a little curious uh, if there's some past history because currently the developer kind of does everything else like we, we you know they they're they're putting in the curbs and the sidewalk and the streets and the the underground and um, right down to sodding the boulevard so we're, we're having the developer do everything as per the city specifications and we have to inspect it and they have to warrant it uh, you know which might mean their subcontractors as well and sort of everything with the exception of the trees and only the trees so when you when you think about it, it is a bit of a confusing thing that uh, they're even responsible for doing the landscaping like putting the grass in so it's all done and then we come back and do that one thing and again I'm not criticizing because because maybe there's a reason um, so you know just before we we do jump in it sounds logical but maybe there's and it sounded like earlier you didn't have that as a hill to die on but I did want to clarify that because it would certainly be more logical that we just have not only this developer but any developer have to do it all we supply this uh, prescribe the species and the spacing the location we approve all that we have to inspect them just like we do with the curb the sidewalk everything yeah through your worship uh, freeze we have so many discussions about this topic yeah. too <laughs> but the, the key difference is timing so for most of the hard infrastructure types of so roads, curbs, pipes, all the stuff you're talking about, that, that's put in at the start of development, right? Before you start sell lots and it's a predictable construction timeline. If you go in, you put it in, it goes under warranty for two years, you do the inspection, it becomes city infrastructure, done. Trees are different because the trees are only put in after the, the lots are sold and built on. So in some cases you're dealing with a subdivision where let's say the market's not super hot and the homes are only going in you know five six years so it's not like there's one warranty period you just go out there put all the trees and the city goes out and inspects them all at the same time that would be wonderful but they only put them in after the construction like the the, the homes are up and then like Steve was saying well now I want my tree well in, in the past the re way the reason was changed because this can kind of drag on and on and it's a challenging thing for the city to track and administer like, or this isn't none of this is rocket science uh, municipalities all over the place can achieve developers planting trees so that's not the argument but that's why it was put in place okay well there's a little bit of logic to the other side but so if, if nothing else I mean we could try it in this development if it doesn't work out obviously we're not going to keep doing it but okay I just wanted to ask that question okay back to the motion as Councilor Barry has uh, proposed it any further discussion Sorry, this was uh, complicated. This was as complicated for us as it is, obviously, in the planning and engineering department, what they do. So uh, not seeing any uh, further discussion. All ready for the motion? Let me make sure I get Councillor Brown up here. Ready for the question? Do I have mover wish close? Uh, just real quickly, Your Worship. I mean, we've had heard good discussion from both sides, administration and, and the developer on this, and, and, and I think we're trying to find a compromise here that satisfies both parties and especially with the Southwest Development uh, Secondary Plan being adopted and, and trying to adhere to our own bylaws and not changing them every time a new development comes up. Um, I think we're trying to find a, a, something that will work here for both parties so I'm hoping that uh, everybody will support this and uh, hopefully this can get moving forward right away. Very good. I'm going to call for the question then. All those in favour? Opposed? That is carried unanimously, including Councillor Brown. Thank you very much for uh, working through that, everybody, especially uh, Ryan and Patrick. Uh, next item, please. That's part of the motion. Unless you can do it down the street name separately.
Or are you, Your Worship, we're just clarifying. We got everything covered in this motion. Yeah, we'll speak. Yeah, please. We just want to make sure we have included the street names and. That's your worship to council. I know we're all sick of this item right now, but uh, there was just a, at the, after the development agreement, there was another condition for an easement. So hopefully that was the intent of Councillor Barry's motion was to in include the easement because that's a standard yep. condition mm -hmm. that was just part of the recommendation, not part of the development agreement. And then the other one was regarding street names because when a new street name comes forward that's not part of the registry, it goes to a public hearing. Planning Commission had a hearing on these street names, and then City Council passes a resolution for these names to become part of a registry, and then they, there's a bylaw to register the new street name. So in short, we need to kind of finish those components yeah, we'll of that. Finish the, the, the motion, and then we can kind of move forward. The street names are hockey players. It's consistent with the theme. They provided the information to Planning Commission, and the Planning Commission was on side, which is why it's coming to Council. Thank you. So we, we need a motion to that effect. Councilor Barry, go ahead. Thank you, Worship. I'll just finish this off. The, uh, and that administration be authorized to prepare a development agreement containing all conditions and requirements to protect the city's interest in accordance with any procedures, policies, bylaws, and acts. And number two, the owner or successor submitting written confirmation to the City of Brandon Planning and Buildings Department that arrangements have been made for plan of easement to the satisfaction of Manitoba Hydro and Central Gas, Bell MTS, Westman Communications Group and registering the easement agreement along with the easement plan if required in series with the plan of subdivision. And further, the request to the following street names as per subdivision application be made, uh, map be approved. Uh, one, Hanlon Crescent, number two, Allison Way, and number three, Ferrero Drive. Seconder, please. Councillor Shapoye, who wish to speak? No, Your Worship. Anybody else have any questions, comments? Any hockey fan want to give us the, the uh, resumes of Hanlon, Allison, and Ferraro? Anybody ever told you that Ferraro so, so scored, what was it, 108 goals in one season? Okay. Can we complicate this by saying trees planted on that street will not be used for hockey sticks at any point in time? <laughs> That's good. Well, street hockey allowed? All right. I'm going to call for the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? <coughs> that is carried. Thank you. Next item, please. Under the order of bylaws, Your Worship, bylaw number 7232, which is the borrowing of funds for the extension of 34th Street. There is an amendment required prior to second reading. Very good. Councillor Cameron. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that bylaw number 7232 to borrow funds for the purpose of constructing and extending 34th Street from Pacific Avenue to McDonald Avenue be amended by deleting Clause 3 in its entirety and substituting the following thereof. That the borrowing of the aforesaid project shall be issued by the City of Brandon in the province of Manitoba and shall be payable at a Bank of Montreal in Brandon or at the principal office of the bank in one of the cities of Winnipeg, Toronto, Montreal or Vancouver, Canada at the holder's option and shall be dated the 31st day of January 2020. Seconder, please. Councillor Cullen, sorry. Who wishes to speak? Uh, very briefly, Your Worship, I'll actually turn it over to Mr. Hammond, who can uh, speak a little bit to this and, and the need for the change here. Uh, through your, you, Your Worship, to Councillor Cameron. So this is the final housekeeping item to uh, finalize the bylaw for our borrowing. As part of our commitment uh, for the um, the rec center uh, redevelopment, as part of our commitment to that uh, developer, uh, we agreed to do an at-level crossing at uh, from 34th to McDonald. And in this year's financial plan, uh, the or pardon me, no, this is not in this year's financial plan. This is a separate application for borrowing. So, uh, first reading of the bylaw was held earlier. Uh, in the year and then we just now received municipal board uh, authority for that borrowing and uh, second and third uh, reading of this bylaw would uh, complete the, that bylaw. Now I should note that um, as with every borrowing bylaw uh, typically the initial um, borrowing rate and term 
is amended once we actually execute the, the, the borrowing. So right now you'll note that this um, borrowing has provisions for borrowing for 10 years at six and one quarter percent. We will know, we know that will not be the case when we actually execute the borrowing. So at that time, we always come back to council with uh, a recommendation to amend the, the bylaw, uh, typically with a, uh, a lesser borrowing rate and sometimes even a shorter borrowing term. Thanks for that, Mr. Hammond. Any uh, further discussion? This is an amendment to the uh, um, Reading and then we'll <coughs> give it uh, second and third reading as amended. So, uh, ready for the question? All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. And uh, I'll uh, go ahead, Councillor Cameron. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, that the bylaw as amended be given second reading. As amended. As amended. Yeah. Seconder, please. Councillor Loreggio, any discussion? Call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Third reader is in order. Councilor Cameron. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, that the bylaw be read a third and final time. Seconded by Councilor Cullen. Seeing no discussion. Again, third reading uh, recorded vote is in order. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried unanimously, including Councilor Brown. Next item, please. Bylaw number 7262, sorry, 7256, which is the rezoning of property at 235 Glen Avenue. Councillor Fawcett. Thank you. Through your worship, to rezone property located at 235 Glen Avenue from commercial arterial zone to residential mobile modular home zone. Third reading. Seconder, please. Councillor Parker. Who wish to speak? Uh, no, we had uh, discussions on this. It is a, uh, a, a project. It, it's quite an interesting looking project if it goes as, uh, as per planned with uh, uh, these uh, affordable housing, uh, smaller lots, uh, centralized location for garbage, recycle, green bins and such. That was something we made sure we brought up. Uh, there's 10 lots in the common power to sign parking with them and uh, they're looking at modern traditional cottage exteriors with the choice of four designs in it. So it's an interesting little project up uh, in, near Glendale. Uh. Very good. If there's no further discussion, we'll call for the question. Once again, third reading uh, recorded vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried unanimously, including Councillor Brown. Uh, next item, please. Bylaw number 7262, which is to repeal the Multifamily Affordable Housing Program bylaw. Motion. Councillor Lupke. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that bylaw number 7262 to repeal bylaw number 6917 to establish the Multifamily Affordable Housing Program to provide financial assistance for affordable housing projects in the City of Brandon be read a second time. Second, please. Councillor Chaboye. Move wish to speak. Uh, briefly, Your Worship, uh, we're repealing the bylaw in order to uh, establish a new bylaw that will further align us with current construction realities, community needs, and the provincial and federal affordable housing strategies. And in order to develop a new bylaw, we need to. Well said. Any further discussion? Seeing none, call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Third reading is in order. Councillor Lupke. Sure, I will uh, move that the bylaw be read a third and final time. Seconded by Councillor Shaboye. Any discussion? Can't call for the question. Third reading, recorded vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried unanimously, including Councillor Brown in line. Next item, please. Bylaw uh, number, <coughs> excuse me, 7265, which is an amendment to the zoning bylaw regarding floodplain regulations. And again, there is an amendment required prior to second and third reading. Councilor Fawcett. Yes, thank you, through your worship. That bylaw number 7265 to amend portions of section 69 of zoning bylaw number 7124 with respect to floodplain regulations <laughs> be amended by deleting in section 1A the definition of floodplain dike protection area in its entirety and substituting the following therefore. Floodplain dike protection area included lands protected from flooding by the city engineered dike system 
These lands are still at risk of flooding should a failure of the city dike system occur. Seconder, please. Councilor Cameron, who wish to speak? Uh, this is just a, a little bookkeeping to make sure that that line is in there. We've changed our system since. Yeah, and I think Mr. Nickel is prepared to answer questions if there are some, or did you have some comments you wanted to make? Uh, okay, that'd be good. Ryan's always very well prepared. I want to make sure that he's sure, given the you. opportunity to provide what he's prepared. And just very quickly before, because this is a fairly significant change, and that's it's just the only piece, is that uh, there was quite an extensive process where we went through and we talked about that dike floodplain area and the different rules and regulations and currently there's a requirement that you have to build all the buildings at a really high elevation and uh, the, the overall direction was was that there should be a little bit of a shift in the system and that since we've invested in the dike improvements to a certain level that we can now allow some more development to occur without having to build it up. So that's what this is about. It's about changing the rules. So that means the next Toyota that comes in doesn't come to council for a variance. They just come in for a permit. We will be coming forward with a secondary plan, a vision for the area here within the coming months. That is the second component of the project, but this was phase one. And we wanted to make sure we got it through for this construction season. So we avoided more one-off variance requests. Thank you. Very good. Before you go away, just in case there's any questions of Ryan while he's up. Apparently not. Thank you. Okay, back to the amendment as moved by Councillor Fawcett. If there's not any further discussion, we'll call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Uh, that's the amendment. Uh, second reading is amendment would be in order. Yes, thank you. Uh, through your worship, that bylaw number 7265 as amended be read a second time. Seconder, please. Councilor Shaboye. Any discussion? Seeing none, call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Third reading in order. Councilor Fawcett. Thank you, Your Worship, that the bylaw be read a third and final time. Seconded by Councilor Shaboye. Again, we're going to call for the question. Recorded vote in order. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried unanimously, including Councilor Brown. Next item, please. File number 7267, which is the rezoning of 1901 and 1955 34th Street. Councilor Barry. Thank you, Worship. I move that bylaw number 7267 to rezone a portion of property located at 1901 and 1955 34th Street from Agricultural General Zone under the RM Corn Walls Zoning Bylaw number 1558 09 99 to residential single detached. Uh, RSD and parks and recreation zones be read a second time. Seconder, please. Councilor Reggio, who wish to speak? Um, this again is just got, uh, all part and positive with the Bellafield Holdings, which we've talked around uh, the area several times tonight. So I'm just going to kind of leave it at that. It's just the development that we've been talking about here with the extra lots. Yeah, taking the uh, open space. To, open space uh, to actually, 75. The yeah. Correct zoning now. Um, no discussion. I'm going to call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Third reading is in order. Councilor Berry? Yes, I move that the law bylaw be read a third and final time. Second by Councilor Reggio. There's no discussion. We're going to call for the question again. Recorded vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That's carried unanimously, including Councilor Brown. Next item, please. Bylaw number 7272, oh, I'm sorry, I missed this again. <clears throat> Bylaw number 7268, which is to open the H-shaped -shape, H lane between Princess and Ross Avenues and 28th and 29th Streets. Councilor Cameron. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that bylaw number 7268 to legally open the H-shaped parcel located between Princess and Rosser Avenue and 28th and 29th Street be read a second time. Seconded by Councilor Parker. Who wish to speak? Just very briefly, Your Worship, uh, just for the uh, uh, residents in that area, this is just an odd bit of cleanup on a property that uh, was privately held for a number of years, and the city uh, did acquire the property, um, more so just to sort of clean up some of the uh, uh, usage in the area. So that's all I would say to that. Very good. 
No further discussion or questions? We will call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried. Third reading, please. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that the bylaw be read a third and final time. Seconded by Councillor Parker. No discussion. We'll call for the question. Recorded vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried unanimously, including Councillor Brown. Next item, please. Bylaw number 7272, which is to repeal the Home Renovation Tax Assistance Program bylaw. Councillor Dujarli. Thank you, Your Worship. I move that uh, bylaw number 7272 to repeal bylaw 6873 Home Renovation Assistance Program to incentivize renovations and repairs by middle to low income households in the City of Brandon be read a second time. Secretary, please. Councillor Cameron, who wishes to speak? Briefly, Your Worship. Uh, when this came up first reading, I'll be honest, I didn't even know we had this bylaw. <laughs> and uh, uh, <laughs> so we have a lot of bylaws, right? So this one kind of slipped under the radar. And uh, as I read through it, I was like, I can see why we're uh, repealing it, uh, that only one uh, member of, of one resident of, of Brandon has ever taken uh, advantage of the program, which was basically um, offsetting um, municipal taxes uh, to uh, a portion of the renovation that they were going to uh, incur. Unfortunately, those who are in low income uh, uh, didn't really have the funds available to, to move forward with any, re any renovation, so they would need more of a grant as opposed to uh, tax offsetting um, assistance. And so we're repealing this uh, much in the same way that we repealed the uh, multifamily affordable housing. Uh, my, my question, um, if I'm allowed uh, to, to ask one, is just why this wouldn't have been part of the affordable housing bylaw, why there was a separate home renovation yes. tax assistance program. We can ask yeah, I, you know, obviously on the books is just two different bylaws, and so we're cleaning yeah. it all up, so we got to so take... this gives us an opportunity to do things all yeah. in one, one Yeah, bylaw. you know, I think as we had previous sessions on this, um, you know, once the senior level, levels of government have uh, established their programs, then we'll be able to uh, tailor make ours accordingly. I think that was our game plan, right? So. Yes. Anyway, this uh, this makes sense, I think, and we're you know optimistic, uh, in spite of everything, that there will be um, a word from the province on how they're going to move forward with affordable housing. I agree. Hope you're right. Okay. Uh, ready for the question? Then all those in favor. Opposed? That is carried. Third reading is in order. Councillor DeJarley, if you like. Yes, through your worship, that the bylaw be read a third and final time. Seconded by Councillor Lupke. And if there's no discussion, we're calling for the question. It will be a recorded vote. All those in favor? Opposed? That is carried unanimously, including Councillor Brown. Next item, please. Bylaw number 7273, which is to create the Municipal Tax Incentive Program for 3409 Victoria Avenue. Okay, due to a potential conflict of interest, as in the past, I'm going to vacate and turn the chair over to Deputy Mayor uh, DeJarley. You just stand in your chair? I'm going to stay right here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> COVID deputy responsibilities here. So I see um, Councillor Cullen has his uh, hand up. Um, thank you, Your Worship. I move that bylaw number 7273 to create a municipal tax incremental financing program for 3409 Victoria Avenue be read a second time. Councillor Cameron, seconder, would you wish to speak? Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, this uh, property is known as the, the old Zellers site. Uh, as everyone knows, we've had a little difficulty getting a little traction there to uh, see if we can redevelop and get it back on the tax rolls. Um, it, uh, the tax rolls that it has had have been diminishing uh, at a, a rate where we uh, felt that we needed to use this tool to step in and help this development out to get it back on, the, on full tax rolls. And so we were willing to uh, um, make it so we could defer some taxes in order the, for the investment to be made uh, in the property and for the residents that uh, are in the ward. Thank you for that. Any other councillors willing meeting to comment? Let's say things are moving along there now. Looks like there's some 
construction moving forward. I, I do miss uh, Princess Dental being downtown, but uh, it's still a hop, skip, and a jump away to get my teeth done. So, <laughs> seeing no other uh, comments, I'll call for the question. All those in favor? Opposed? And that's carried. That and then a third reading is in order. Thank you again, Your Worship. I move that the bylaw be read a third and final time. And, and Councillor Shibuya, uh, second. Uh, um, City Clerk, is this a recorded vote or? Yes. So this is a recorded vote. All those in favor? I can confirm oh. that Councillor Brown did also vote. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Brown. Also approved. So that was uh, approved unanimously. And. Um, that's that we can call the real deal back in. <laughs> Just a drink. You got a speaker out there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. oh yeah. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor and Council. Next item, please. Uh, giving of notice, Your Worship. Any giving of notice this evening? Seeing none. Okay. Hey, uh, before we move to the next one, I, I did. Uh, receive a message about the snowbirds uh, so they do have a Twitter handle and they, they have tweeted out that they're uh, planning on on landing in Brandon at 10 30 a.m. Uh, tomorrow and doing a fly pass uh, coming from Winnipeg flying past Portage by the looks of it and kind of veering south and then coming in obviously over the city probably over the hospital and and landing at 10 30 so they'll probably do a few maneuvers above the city I'm going to say somewhere between 10 and 10 30 they do say those are tentative and weather dependent and so on and so forth so uh, Twitter seems to be one area that they're uh, putting it out there so people that are interested uh, in seeing the snowbirds fly over can